Really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going to go riding soon, man. We definitely got to go riding soon. And uh, yeah, I was just on the phone with him like 10 minutes ago. So gorgeous. Uh, Jenny, nice to see you. Rhea Sherry Felia, welcome to SOR Chat. Thank you for joining us. Am I going to make it here? Rooted in gorgeous sacredness. How are you? Sam Faz, nice to see you. Sinister Vax, altered. Welcome to our chat room. Thank you for joining us. Bob Birkins, hey, you're not kicked out yet. Just yet. The keyword there is yet. All right, that's everybody so far tonight. So thank you so much. Uh, Shrumanati, nice to see you. Mystic K from Toronto, how are you? All right, we got 20 seconds left. I want to say that uh, thank you to all the veterans tuning us in. Remember, you can go to the SOR website, spaceoutradio.com forward slash shop. You can get some great gear, some great swag. We have it all there. It's not just T-shirts, so check it on out. It's a great way to support what we do on this show along with the Super Chat. So thank you so much. We're going to fire this thing up in three seconds. So everybody... Get your horns up. It's time to rock to Bumblefoot. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Just go to YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire and check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Dan Warren is a UFO Twitter contributor and UFO TikTok content creator from Middle Tennessee. And he's got the accent for it, too. Nice beard. Nice high and tight beard, by the way. Yeah, Dan's obsession with UFOs dates back to his childhood when his imagination was abducted by the sentient mechanical alien beings depicted in the 1980s Hasbro cartoon, The Transformers. So much better than today's. A mechanical engineer by education and training, and just so happens to have a master's degree in engineering from the same college as James Lakatsky, Yep, he's lucky enough to share a birthday with J. Allen Hynek. You can find him on Twitter at Hey, look over there. Look spelt L U K, or on TikTok as the fifth pillar of emphasis. Find him on YouTube riding the coattails of our good friends Ben and Joe from UFO Garage as well. Dan Warren, what a pleasure to have you on Spaced Out Radio. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me tonight. I am so excited that you're here, man. And, you know, last week you were on with the boys from UFO Garage and having a good time. And I I saw you a couple times rolling your eyeballs because you have to with those guys. You never know what to expect. Absolutely not. It's a a wild card every time you have a conversation with them. You never know where it's going to head. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, they, they are so genuine. And I absolutely love those guys, Ben and Joe. And I and like I always say to all our listeners and our subscribers, if you haven't signed up from UFO Garage just yet, you're, you're really missing out. But let's learn about you, my friend. You know, you're a guy who really came out of nowhere, like all of us. I did almost seven years ago, came out of nowhere and started this show. You've come out of nowhere and really taken TikTok by, by storm. I mean, did you ever think at this point you'd have 64,000 subscribers following everything you're talking about, about UFOs? So I, I hate the term followers. I love the term family. I like to consider them my TikTok family. And I do hope that some of them have shown up to invade the chat room tonight. But yeah, I, I would have never expected to have the response that I've gotten from TikTok. So I, I'm glad to have them. Um, I, I made a video just a few days ago saying that them that they are responsible for the channel just about as much as I am, because there's no way I would continue to do what I'm doing if no one was watching my product. So 
I, I owe them a debt of gratitude just for riding along with me while this uh, crazy train that is ufology has taken taken hold of me. Uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit more about the whole TikTok thing a little bit later because I, I'm going to tell you, we don't have a TikTok channel just yet, but I mean, it really seems the way that you have to do things these days as social media continues to ever evolve into the monster that it is. But for you, you mentioned that it was the Transformers, the 80s version, not the not the 2000s version, the 80s version that I grew up on as well, that really sparked your interest for entities from space and and it was also the responsible for the first time i ever cried at a movie is when optimus prime died in the the, the transformers movie i shed a tear my mom will not let me forget about that uh, i get reminded of it re regularly but yeah i mean i was obsessed with that show and i wanted to be mikey so bad just to be able to hang out with bumblebee and get to enjoy the company of these giant robots that were intelligent and could transform into awesome looking cars uh, which i also consider are one of the reasons that i became a mechanical engineer is because i had the toys and those are a mechanical engineer's dream come true because they just pivot and bend and and move and transform into different objects so it's i think that was where the seed got planted for both an interest in life beyond earth on Cybertron or wherever it is, and a, a fascination with all things mechanical. You know what pissed me off about the original Transformers is the kid there. I mean, out of all the vehicles he could ride in, whether it was Optimus Prime Semi or the Lamborghinis or Jazz the Porsche, okay, he chooses a Volkswagen Beetle. That Maybe always he's humble. Me. Maybe he's trying to keep it, it humble. It just bugged me, man. It bugged me big time. I don't know why. To this day, like almost 35 years later, I'm still pissed off about that. Why would yeah, you do and, that? And he got his own movie, and they were like, ah, a, a, a Volkswagen's not good enough. We're going to have to change it into a Camaro. So at least they figured that out um, during the movies. Yeah, thank goodness for the prequel to tie it yeah. all together. Yeah, when I saw, you know, it was funny. My son, who's eight years old, he he was watching on Netflix the the prequel, and I'd never seen it before. And you know, I'm like, well, at least they got Bumblebee playing a bug. And here I am watching it, and then right at the final scene, where Bumblebee meets up with Optimus Prime on the Golden Gate Bridge. I like I almost shed a tear at that point because that just hit my childhood so hard, man. So hard. It was awesome. Awesome. I could talk Transformers all night long. I really could. I love the movie. But it's amazing though how that cartoon really set your life tone to become a mechanical engineer. I mean, that that amazes me cuz so few people follow through with something that they see as a kid and then become uh, or choose their career because of what was influencing them. So my, I'll have to give my dad a little, just a slight a bit of credit for my mechanical inclination as well. Cause he's a, he's the best engineer that I know. And he doesn't have an engineering degree, never graduated from college or anything, but that guy's a phenomenal engineer. Um, super talented at anything that has to do with building construction, repairing, so that's another reason why I'm an engineer, of course, is because I've, I got blessed with mechanical inclination from him. So when did you start following the UFO topic seriously? Seriously is a um, relative term, of course. Uh, I've, I've delved into it multiple times throughout my life, and I kind of consider looking into UFOs, <clears throat> excuse me, as a yo-yo it's it's a roller coaster ride like sometimes you're all in and you're just elbows deep in books and trying to to learn and educate yourself and then the next week you're con you're considering that you're completely uh crazy that you that you have missed the mark and that you're wasting your time so it's a love-hate relationship that i've had with it my entire life where i I've been into it. I've backed out of it. I've gone back into it, but I've always come back. And I've always heard that it's something that once it bites you, you're hooked for life. And I am a walking testament to that right now. Okay. So 
was it the but was it the to the stars academy that really brought your focus was it the new york times article that brought you into it that sucked you in that says okay it's coming i can feel it i got to do something i got to get my feet wet in this so the ttsa press conference their their introduction to the world was definitely an ignition source for me and it was validation as well because of the the quality of the people that were associated with that press conference when Steve just Steve justice was a big one for me. Cause I, I know how big of a deal it is for him to come out of skunk works running that and be involved. And then there was this guy named Lou Elizondo I'd never heard of. And I thought that was interesting. Chris Mellon came out as well. I'd heard Pal put off before. So all those guys being involved all of a sudden out of nowhere really did pique my interest and, and, provided some sort of validation for me because I all, you want someone to have your back. If you're looking into something like this, you want to turn around and be able to say, look, these serious dudes are looking into this as well as me. So I'm not crazy. If they're, if they're looking into it, then there's my justification for digging a little bit deeper. And that's why I'm a first round investor in TTSA full disclosure. Oh, sorry, your shares have gone down a little bit there, but <laughs> they're they're about almost up to what they're worth. The, uh, what the paper they're printed on is worth, I think. Well, hey, you know what? You took a chance, and you know, hopefully, uh, Mister Delong and friends can turn things around. You're not the only person I know who invested in it, but I mean, hey, you know what? Back then, it was something that it's exciting. I mean, this is a a, a phenomena that the majority of people on this planet have absolutely lambasted for decades and made fun of people who were chasing UFOs or claimed to be experiencers. And here they had all the egg on the face trying to figure out, what? This is real? This is what's going on? But for somebody like you who had always believed, I mean, that's something that, that worked in your favor for that. So I can understand why you jumped on the bandwagon there. It's very easy. Yeah, and I I also looked at it as a all right, I'm going to get some skin in the game. It's I'm going to I'm going to lay my money on the table so I can say that I'm involved in some way shape or form in what's happening. I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't ever expect I didn't look at it as an investment, but I looked at it as like, hey, I'm placing a bet on a, a sports game and Good I'm going to pay more I'm going to pay more attention to what they're doing if I have skin in the game than if I just watched them and was criticizing them from a distance. I want to be, I needed that uh, carrot in front of me to keep my interest and keep my focus on what they were doing so that I could continue to dig deeper and uh, figure out what's, try to figure out what's going on. Well, I mean, for you, Dan, as as you kind of looked at it, when you when you invested that, what did your wife say? I mean, what did your family say the minute you started talking to UFOs? Because I'm sure there had to be a you're nuts around um, there somewhere. My my wife wasn't shocked whatsoever, and I cleared it with her well in advance of actually pulling the trigger and, and investing in them. Uh, but like I said, I don't even like to use the word invest. I'd rather just say support. I, I just wanted to support them in some way. Uh, so that that's what I did. But she she knew that that was where my heart was, uh, was looking into this UFO subject. And this was my way to, like I said, put a little skin in the game and enjoy the ride. And it, it's, everyone has to admit at this point that it's been a fun ride, if nothing else, since 2017. It, it really has. But it's also caused a lot of division within the community. I hadn't noticed. It, no, really. <laughs> and we're going to get into that because I think that's an important part for people to learn about that, Dan. You know, but the division that, that has happened, do you think that's growing pains or do you think there's real issues within the UFO community right now? So one of the things that I've learned from making videos and getting a lot of feedback from people that watch my videos and have opinions on the topics that I cover um, is that mankind has the ability to screw up anything we, and we look at. So I think the divisiveness that you're seeing is just mankind being human. And we're going to get, you're going to get that in every, I bet if you go to wrestling, Twitter, 
they're they're going to be fighting even as hard, if not harder than us, uh, just as hard as we do with each other. There's going to be clicks there. Politics, of course, we don't even get into because it's going to be so toxic. So I think it's just part of human nature is what we're seeing right now. Um, it just couldn't come at a worse time, in my opinion, because of where how far we've come in, since 2017. It's almost like we're trying to take a few steps backwards by the way that everyone's behaving right now. Is it good for the field, is especially the outsiders looking in? This is the big concern that I have going forward because I always try and look from an outside perspective. Like, for instance, when TTSA showed up, and I've said this hundreds of times on this show now, I told our listeners point blank, sit back. Let's see what happens. Let's see what direction they were going. And for me, there was a number of red flags right off the bat, which we made public on this show as observations. But for you, uh, you know, coming in, looking at this at a completely different angle, I, I'm curious, you know, is what's going on from an outside position healthy for what the public is seeing or what we're trying to promote? So the very first video I put on TikTok was promoting people or encouraging people to join UFO Twitter. And I have not asked, encouraged people to join UFO Twitter in the last several months because of the way that it's behaving. And it's more or less the, you, you can't, it's hard to get involved in ufology through UFO Twitter right now because it's intimidating. It is a high threshold of knowledge to be able to have a conversation with someone there and not feel outgunned. Um, or at a disadvantage. So right now, it's not a good marketing tool for in, the phenomena, for learning about it. So that's what, that's one of the reasons I started my TikTok channel was to make it easier to consume for people that were not familiar with the topic and don't want to have to have the conversation with people that outclass them, I guess I'll say, as far as their knowledge uh, goes. Because everything in this topic is about context. You can say 1947 to me. I understand what that means. Someone that's coming into this conversation new, it's not going to have the same weight as what it means to us. So that's why I feel like there is a need for a bridge between newbies and UFO Twitter at this point. But, you know, I can understand that, that divide. Because very few of the old guard, let's call them the old guard, really paid attention, Dan, to what we are doing and what we were trying to accomplish here on SOR. You know, they already had their favorites. There are still people from that old guard we've never interviewed before. And we're seven years in, and I think we got a pretty good reputation. But that's the old guard. And the new guard only seems about promoting themselves and what they are doing and their knowledge. And I agree with them on doing that, to be honest, because many of them have been turned off by the old guard as well. I mean, the old guard's fighting for their positions. It seems like with this new, more aggressive, social media savvy young crowd that's addicted to this topic. Do you see it the same way? Yeah, there's an, there's an adaption, adapt, adaptation that needs to occur is occurring right now we're we're changing the way we communicate with each other just as human beings it, it used to be it was the conferences that you would go to to try to share ideas and thoughts well that is not where we live anymore if we went back 10 years we wouldn't recognize ufology right now we're living in a world where social media is the predominant means of communication between large groups of people so it's gonna take some time for the old guard to adjust to that. And some of them are not going to be able to adjust to it as well as others, because I, I don't want to use the word old, but old dogs, it's hard to teach them new tricks sometimes. So I, I, and, and there's also even within UFO Twitter itself, there are the originators, the OGs that were on UFO Twitter that are still there. And there's all, there's an influx of new people since the 60 minutes uh, piece came out of of new people with sharp minds and they're very intelligent people. So they're just now starting to get in 
involved in it. So it's branching out from where it started and it's going to be a constantly evolving, changing, moving target. You know, the one thing that I will say is this. I like the fact that you are professional enough to admit you're not a UFO researcher. You're somebody who gathers the information and studies it and puts it out in public. A lot of the news reels, a lot of the videos, everything. And, and you kinda, you're kind of like that culmination of the public to say, hey, you guys be the judge. I'm just supplying the, the channel. I'm just supplying what you think. I'm curious, what are you thinking? You know, why did you take that route rather than go for the research route that seems like everybody else does? Have you ever tried to talk to someone and at, and them ask you, what, what are you interested in UFOs about? What's going on right now? Like anytime you try to explain the UFO subject to someone, it is difficult to go from zero to I'll inform you. Uh, it's very hard. So I had a conversation with my uh, neurologist. I had a concussion a few years ago and I was getting treatment and he was, he found out I was interested in the topic and I would tell him, Hey, this just happened. This was interesting to me. And he, and he would say, well, why is that interesting to you? And I'd have to back up and tell him, well, that's interesting because of this thing that was interesting. Oh, and that thing's interesting because I had, because of this thing that happened before it. And, oh, it links to this other thing. So I started to realize that context of inf around the information is just as important as the information itself. So that's what I decided to try to do with my channel is provide not just this single piece of information, but try to say, hey, it's this, this, this article is stating this fact, but this is relevant to this other conversation that's going on over here uh, that you'll need to know as well. So here's links to both of these things and they can help you more or less triangulate your thoughts are on a particular subject that just came out. So it's just trying to provide a, a breadth of breadth of information instead of a single point. Yet you don't provide your opinion. You allow people to figure it out for themselves, which is very rare in the UFO world because the majority of us are all trying to figure out or get our point across to have people believe us that I'm the one with the answers. Nobody else knows what they're talking about. Stick with me. Stick, you know, hang out with us. Lock chains with us. Yet you're not doing that. You want healthy critique. You want healthy opinion from people. And, and it leads to debate. It leads to discussion, which I think is healthy as we got about 90 seconds to go. Yeah, I, I've learned a lot more from the failures in my life than the successes. So I know that when I'm wrong, there's a lesson to learn. So I'm not going to sit here and tell someone I know what it is. I could very well be wrong, but I would rather sp spread this information around and share the thoughts that I have about it and then try to get some feedback from you. Like I said, my my views have changed just based on the comments that I receive on some of the videos that I've made in the, in the last year. So it's a give and take. There's definitely a positive to having that feedback without trying to force someone to conform to your thoughts. Which is rare, very rare. And I, and honestly, I commend you for it. You know, I wish more people were like that. We need and I don't know the answers. That's another big thing. I'm not going to claim I do because I don't. But but that's healthy. If you don't know something, just say you don't know. It's a lot better than trying to, you know, fiddle your way around words and make yourself look like an idiot for people who are in the know. That's for sure. Yeah, I love to speculate just as much as the next person I will tell you when I'm speculating and I will tell you when I do not know the answer to a question or the reason for something being the way it is in, in ufology. Well, you know what? I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break at the bottom of the hour. I'm excited about this show. Dan Warren is here. He's got a great TikTok channel with over 64,000 subscribers. It's called Fifth Pillar of emphasis underscore ufo you can check out any of his videos they're fantastic yeah this is the man when it comes to ufo tiktok and we're going to get more into tiktok the meaning of it why it's important and the ufo agenda all coming up as we continue on with spaced out radio next
All right, we're clear, dude. All right. So I've been uh, ignoring the comments because I don't know how you can multitask as well as you do. You are going, I see your eyes darting around everywhere. Whenever I'm on a show, I have to hide the comments because I, they are so distracting. But I wanted, I've, I've got questions. I wanted to, I put some questions together for the group to see if I can get some funny answers. All right. Um, Go ahead, man. They're all so, yours. One of my questions for everybody in the chat. Let me get to the right tab here. All right. If we travel to another civilized planet and they had restaurants, what would be on their menu? And funny answers only. So let me know what you guys think in the chat because I'm interested. There's got to be something. I I asked a question. uh, Jeremy Corbell posted something today about... What would you ask an alien if if you could, or someone that was in the know? And I basically said, where in the universe is the best place to get a country fried steak? So uh, what is that? Chop, chop, hi. Oh, okay. Hmm. Let's see here. Pancakes, human beans, G West with uh, breakfast. Human beans. Human beans, not beings. Vin Man, breakfast for dinner, you sick bastard. All right. Uh, a video game player. Hi, Jeremy Jones. Super Carol, nice to see you. Nicole Perron, looking lovely tonight. I'm using the French version, not the American version. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Uh, this is going downhill space, faster than I thought it space would. Space poutine, honest. homo sapien burgers, cannabis from Grandmaster, horse piss from Gorgeous Larry. <laughs> Mars bars on Mars. That's the one. Reptilian tacos. I like that. Uh huh. Let's see. Roasted tardigrades. Those are the water bears. Is that what yeah. a tardigrade is, right? Bumble buttocks on the menu. <laughs> Hawaiian pizza. Kick that guy out of the chat. There's that's that's just a bl- abomination. You're not a fan. No, no. Pineapple on pizza. Not a match. It, it's good. That's worse than breakfast for dinner, man. No way, man. Not even close. Jeff Steve Garvey. How's it going, buddy? Lovely Char. Nice to see you. Janet Pine. How are you? Um, Let's see. I think we're good. There. Um, What would I want to see? I don't even know. I'd be just so curious. Jason, how are you, buddy? Thanks for coming on in. We have Chinese buffets here. That surely they have like an alien buffet that you could do the uh, little bit of this, a little bit of that approach. You damn well know they have Seven Eleven with their food stocks. They're everywhere. Yeah, Kevin, what's happening? It's an interesting question. Well, I'm I'm all for new taste experiences. Like I, like those food vacations sound amazing. Like I want to go to I've never been to New Orleans, but that's why I want to go just to eat my way through the city and see what authentic Cajun food tastes like cuz it's delicious what I've had in Tennessee. It's great. Look at Helena there. Both of you are nuts. Breakfast for dinner and pineapple with ham on pizza is fantastic or is yummy. <laughs> I knew I'd get somebody upset with that. Yeah, one. Big Willie. Big Willie's like pineapple belongs on pizza. I said what I said. Gene Coleman, welcome to our channel. He wants cow lips. All right, we got about one minute here. You having fun so far? So far, uh, you're right. The first thirty minutes is a little uh, getting the nerves out, but yeah, I think I'm starting to stop fumbling over my words as much. Me too. I got to admit. I, I was a living, believe it or not, because you, you, you admitted earlier for the show, okay, what you did. I'll admit, I was a little intimidated in getting you on here. I thought 64,000 subscribers, he ain't coming on. He ain't coming on. No way. I don't know. The, the exchange rate for TikTok followers to YouTube followers isn't very good, I don't that, think. Well, I'm only, I haven't even hit 14,000 yet, which, to be honest, I'm kind of surprised, but we're pushing it. We're pushing it. And our listeners keep going up every time. Peter James, welcome to the channel. The gorgeous and talented Nicole Sackage. 
There she is, everyone. She has no problem throwing a head of lettuce at you. That's for sure. All right. Thank you so much to Noble Patrick, Cable Guy Matt, Todd, and Cat Chaser for the amazing Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do on our channel on a nightly basis. Hi, Packing Woman on Twitch. Nice to have you here. And uh, thank you to all the veterans who are coming on in. Don't forget, you can do some shopping at our store on our website. Get some great swag. Here we go. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio. Here we go. Let's kick this thing off. My name is Dave Scott. Appreciate you tuning us in wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Check out our swag. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. She's got a brand new article up there now. And of course, follow us on social media on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Dan Warren. He is UFO TikTok, one of the best out there. Fifth pillar of emphasis is his TikTok channel. Highly suggest you go follow him. Be one of his 64,000 plus that are already subscribed. You can follow him on Twitter at, hey, look over there. Look spelt L-U-K. Dan, welcome back, man. Thanks for having me back. I can't believe you didn't kick me off during the break. No, hey, man, we're going to have a lot of fun here. A lot of fun. I want to ask you about TikTok here for a second because, you know, there are a number of TikTok UFO channels out there, but yours is different. You're providing information and kind of pulling people into what they think. Why did you choose TikTok over YouTube or Twitter or other social media varieties to kind of get your message out? Uh, Lack of skills and knowledge would be the first answer to your question because I started out trying to make a YouTube channel um, and it all stems from an interview that Lou Elizondo had with uh, Luis Jimenez on the Unidentified Celebrity Review like back in January and it, it there's the phrase, the right time, right place. Well, certain comments that Lou made during that interview was what I needed to hear at that particular time. And he said, get your butt off the couch, get involved in the conversation and think for yourself. And those words, like I said, they spoke to me and I said, okay, well, I've been lurking in the shadows long enough. I need to do something. What can I do? So I started I, I wrote to Lou Jimenez and said, Hey man, I'd like to get involved and try to do something. I'm not sure what to do yet. I'd like to start a YouTube channel. And he started giving me some advice on how to move forward with that. And I was completely overwhelmed and um, was having a real hard time trying to figure out all the softwares I needed to use and produ- production editing all at one time. So it was, it was quite a task. Well, then I saw a tweet from, Andreas Freeman Stahl, who might be the funniest dude on UFO Twitter. And he said that he had a TikTok account and was getting large amounts of views. And I said, okay, well, if it's easy to repackage some videos that and put it on TikTok and they get some views, let me let me see what this program's about, what this app's about. So I downloaded it and quickly found out that the technology that you need to be able to start a TikTok channel is in your pocket. It's, it's in your hand. It's just a phone. It's everything you need in one location. So it's easy. And I like to take the, the path of least resistance when I can. So that's why I chose TikTok to really start trying to figure things out because I could make a product, put it out there, get feedback on how to improve my product And there's constructive criticism that comes from making videos and getting comments from it. And then there's just mean comments that come back from it. And they both have value. Uh, That's one thing that if anybody does decide to start a TikTok or YouTube channel, you're going to get a lot of feedback, whether you want it or not. And if you can just not take it personally and just try to listen, don't listen to how they say it. Listen to what they're saying. And there, there is 
information in there that you can use to your own advantage to improve your product. Uh, <clears throat> but more or less, TikTok allows me to make videos, put them out there, and the growth potential on TikTok is unlike any other platform that you're going to get right now. Um, I, I'll go into a comparison real quick. Um, sure. Dave, you've, you've watched YouTube, right? Yeah. You, you know, you've, you've got cable TV in your days back when you were watching transformers in the eighties as well. You've sat down for hours and not find, been able to find anything on cable TV. So you just sat there and flipped through the channels over and over for an hour, right? Well, that's what TikTok is. It is channel surfing because all you do, you don't have to search for videos. They deliver them to you. So you just swipe up your next videos up and you can look for one second. You can look for 15 seconds. You can watch it as long as you want and then change the channel, change the channel, change the channel. So you're just sitting there. So that's one of the benefits of it is they are looking for videos that people are going to like. And after you watch certain videos, they, they recognize the type of videos that you like. So they're going to start catering the selection to you. So just imagine if you're flipping through the cable channels instead of just randomly going through the news section, the discovery channel section, all the other, the sports section, if it starts to hone in on the hockey section and it's, it starts to hone in on Bigfoot and the things that you like. So it's going to cater to the person that's using the app. And uh, so, so your videos are going to get exposed to those people that are interested in that particular type of video content. So when I uh, started making UFO videos, it was people from that, that are watching UFO stuff that are actually picking up on it. So it's, it's them broadcasting your information for you. So it's a marketing tool. Uh, more or less for for your content that that is incredible you know i've literally tried to stay away from tiktok you know i i really have but i i think we're getting to the point on this show where it's something that we're going to have to do after following you and and believe it or not one of the biggest reasons why i i see the impact of of tiktok recently was a fellow canadian ryan reynolds and Will Ferrell doing that that silly song, you know? And all of a sudden, it got me addicted. And now, every night, here I am, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I don't even have an account yet, right? But, I mean, this is something that that it's just, in order to get the, the knowledge out to that younger base audience who isn't into YouTube, isn't into... Uh, long form interviews or films or anything. They want those short couple minute snippets and then they're done. They move on to the next one. I mean, doesn't that also show a, a lack of attention span by a lot of people? You hit the nail on the head. That is uh, an absolute truth is the sh attention spans of our society are reducing as the years tick by. So yeah, what you just said is spot on. Um, that's another reason for TikTok being so popular and growing so much lately is because it allows you to just have those quick hits of information or whatever it is you're you're looking for on TikTok. So it's it's that's one of the reasons that I also reached out to or started using TikTok was because it is that younger demographic, and I have kids, I. I want to make my videos to where I could show them to my kids and I could be proud and I want people to be able to, I want kids that do see my videos to, I, I want to talk to them just like I would talk to my kids. So I'm going to put out the information I can as honestly and authentically as possible to everyone, including kids, including uh, there's some really smart people that are retired on there and as well as physicists. So there's all there, it, it runs the gamut of as far as the socioeconomic ladder, but the, the outreach that I intended when I started this was to the younger generation because we need them. It's every organization, every uh, interest and in, uh, to topics like this needs that fresh blood to keep it going forward because then we need the new ideas. We need the new insights. So that's another reason for, for diving into the world of TikTok. 
No, for sure. For sure. Did you think yours would take off the way it did though? No, because I don't have any talent for like, it was rough. Like the very first ones are rough. Like I was like, Ooh, I want to watch these things. So I, it, it eventually started to uh, come together for me. Cause it, like I said, it's, there's still a learning curve associated with it, but everything you need is in your hand. So you can get started and you can improve your process easily with just practice. So it's just practice, practice, practice to make a better product. And eventually started to get to the point where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm proud of what I'm making now. And it's uh, something that I would, and that's when people started actually joining, <clears throat> excuse me, when people started joining and following me more in, in volumes. And it's, it's strange because it's just like one video will get you 10,000 viewers if it lands right. And it's interesting enough. And it seems like it's a log logarithmic growth pattern that you, that you'll experience. Like you'll get to, <clears throat> it'll take you about a month to get to a thousand. And then <clears throat> I'm sorry, my voice take, is take uh, cracking up a little take bit. A yeah, drink. let me grab it. I, I know that, uh, that feeling. I was just there a few days ago, my friend, just there a few days ago. So I totally understand where you are. I mean, that silly cold is going around silly cold. I mean, Hey, got to do what you got to do. I'm okay with that. But yeah, I, how, I also sit in an office most of my day, not talking to anybody, but sending emails. So talking for an hour straight is is a little bit of a change for me. I hear you. I, I do want to ask you: How has the younger generation of those viewers that you have and followers you have on TikTok taken to this subject? Uh, a lot of them are. Well, the big thing that I'm trying to do is provide information that you can dig into deeper yourself. I'm, I'm a hundred percent convinced that someone telling you about UFOs and all the phenomena that encompasses it is not going to get you connected. It's not going to make you want to learn more. I want to dangle a carrot out and say, Hey, here's some information, but if you want to learn more, here's where you go get that information, that long format. Um, I, I provide links in my videos to, so that you can track that stuff down to, to get yourself educated. So I think a self-education program is what's the most important part of it. And I do believe that the feedback I'm getting from the younger kids is that it's easier for them to consume my product, but it's the gateway to more research and an investigation into it as well. So I've gotten positive feedback from them, but I don't ask them their ages or anything like that. So no, I don't no, know but, exactly how young they are. But do you believe though, that that generation of TikTok users, which the statistics show are a younger crowd, well below the age of 30, even into teenage oh, yeah. years, do you think that they have, or are they showing in their comments that they have a very vested interest in, in this topic? Um, I think it depends on I, the younger they are. I don't feel like they're as vested in it because it is, it does take work and there's a lot more distractions out there that are more entertaining and eye pleasing than a 42 year old dude talking to them and doing a PowerPoint presentation basically. But there, there is some interest and in it's uh, another thing that is a valuable aspect of TikTok is there when you, come across a young creator that finds your stuff interesting, you can turn around and follow their channel and it's very reassuring to them. So it's an encouraging step that you can take that doesn't cost anything to help someone proceed further down the road and have that confidence to keep making videos and pursuing their interest even further. So I think there's a good feedback loop there to help out the younger generation. Well, that's good. And, and the fact that you're helping them out and to learn about this topic, I think it's great. I really, I really do think it's great because, you know, you can only see the videos so much. You know, you can only see the videos, the same three videos or the same seven videos that are out there so much. And then that's it. We well, need... There's more than seven because there's a whole bunch of garbage CGI videos that oh, are yeah. very successful on TikTok and you, YouTube and everything. And, and oh, that no. is one of the things that I was trying to counteract is there's so much sm terrible stuff out there like that's just misleading and fake. I wanted to try to provide a voice of reason, a, a more 
calculated approach to the topic, a more sane approach, I guess, less, less shock and awe and more, Hey, here's this interesting thing that's going on in the investigation itself. You guys are, you can come along for the ride on the investigation that's going on right now. And the research that's going into this topic by some highly intelligent individuals, highly competent people like Avi Loeb at Harvard, like Bill Nelson, what he's saying as the NASA administrator, there's all these incredible people that are looking at this from a different perspective. That's never been there before. And you can follow this story just by kind of watching my channel. So I'm going to keep you up to date on it. And a lot of people say I'm their go-to source for UFO related information. That's great. That is great. Now, once again, you are not a researcher. <clears throat> Have you ever seen a UFO before? I've never seen a UFO that's like without a shot of a doubt, a UFO. I've seen anomalous things in the sky. I've, I've, I've got night vision, a night vision monocular that I sit in my backyard and listen to podcasts like SOR on while I'm searching the skies. And I've seen some strange things, some strange lights, but nothing that I've ever said. Oh, my goodness. Look at that thing in the sky. It's a UFO. Really? Hmm. So for you, as being someone who really hasn't seen a UFO or had a close encounter, why do you believe this phenomenon is out there? It's the, sh well, my normal response is math with the infinite universe that we live in. Infinite possibilities exist. I don't care how rare life is when you magnify it by the sheer volume of the universe. Mathematically, it's a certainty that we're not alone. What we're not alone with is the big question for me. Um, but then my, that's that's the logical aspect of my brain. That's the left-hand side of my brain. The right-hand side of my brain is there's a lot of people that are saying they've seen things. There's a lot of people that are having these experiences. They either have to all be lying or one of them just has to tell the truth for it to be legit. So, that, so all these experiences and sightings have to be able to be debunked 100% of the time. For it to for that not to be a possibility that we're being engaged by another intelligence, but just one of them has to be accurate for it to be a definite we're we're being engaged by another intelligence. Do you think extraterrestrials are here? I'm leaning more towards what does extraterrestrial mean exactly? Um, if something came here a long time ago before mankind would they still be considered extraterrestrial if they've been on earth longer than us? Uh, I've heard a lot of people talking like Mac Tonys is an author of a book called crypto terrestrials that I've read. And he has put forth a theory that explains a lot of the logic ga uh, gaps that you have to take when you come, when you consider the extraterrestrial hypothesis, how did they get here over the distances of space? Why don't we see them? How come there? How come there are reproductive overtones in the encounters that are told? Well, those don't make us make a lot of sense if it's a different species from a different far off planet. It does make a lot more sense if there is a biological similarity to humans. If it is from Earth as well, if we share somewhat common DNA, all of those things make sense because they wouldn't have to travel. Their DNA would be virtually compatible with ours if they're from earth or if we uh, and there's there's of course the hybrid uh, theories what if what if there was interference in our development in the past well that could explain why we're seeing differences in what they are and what we are but why they still are interested in the reproductive overtones of some of the uh, encounters that you see do you lean more towards extraterrestrials? Because the UFO world is really, over the last number of years, segregated aliens or extraterrestrials in contact from the UAP phenomena. And much to the chagrin of many in this community that they've done that. Where do you stand on that? Um, I think that it is the easy answer. I don't know if it is the right answer, though. And so when I think about the the amount of time that people have been reporting seeing objects in the skies 
it, it's not a new occurrence. It's been here a while, whatever it is, it's been here. It's, and it could be a, it could also be a bucket of different things that are interacting with this. It doesn't have to be just one, one answer. It could be multiple different intelligences that are interacting with us in some way, shape or form. Um, I think the ET is a definite possibility, but if Jacques Vallée thinks that it is the least, if it, I think he says like, if, if it turns out to just be extraterrestrial, that'll be really boring. I can't remember his, his exact phrase, uh, but that would be like an oversimplification of what we're seeing. And I also like what Grant Cameron says is if we find out what this actually is, it's going to be orders of magnitude more complicated than what we possibly thought it was. It's going to blow our minds. Yeah, so the a- so. extraterrestrials, it just seems too simple to me. Yeah, that's because you don't have aliens. That's what I'll say. You don't have aliens. So, I mean, once you have aliens, it's always aliens. I don't care what Demi Lovato says. It's always <laughs> a, It's always aliens. But... Nonetheless, you know, the division that that has occurred and and brought forward within ufology, though, I mean, as we've stated on this show a number of times, we only got about two and a half minutes left before we got to go to break. It really has caused a big divide where the experiencers have been pushed kind of on a castaways island, like like the criminals back in the early 1800s in the UK who got sent to Australia, you know, like just got rid of them. You know, that's the way a lot of experiencers are are seeing that these days, and much to the chagrin of many. So what what's your opinion on that? So the Barney Hill regression tape is why I think that experiencers are telling the truth. That is the most terrifying uh one of the most terrifying audios I've ever heard. And that's the one to me that stands out as that's a guy that is traumatized has ptsd from it had no desire to be thrust into the spotlight because of his socioeconomic position that he was uh in and in, in the time that he was in so he had so much to lose nothing to gain from from his story and if that like i said that one case is legit then he's not alone he's got other there's other people that are telling us the truth as well. And, and to me, I'm going to believe them. It's hard for me as a non-experiencer. Um, I, I think I've heard several people say it once you've experienced that phenomena or like the, even the Bigfoot phenomenon, if you've experienced that you can tell when others are being truthful or others are not being truthful. So they have a filter that I'm not currently equipped with. So that's kind of where it is, it makes me gun shy to, to tell someone I believe him or not, because I just don't have the knowledge in the background to be able to accurately assess the situation. It is tough. It is tough if you if you can't understand it. Trust me, I, I've been there, and I still don't understand the damn thing that's going on. Really don't, especially when it can pop up at any time without any warning whatsoever. Yet you want to be taken. I don't, I don't want to be taken. Want I want to, to see something going across the sky. Come on. You want At some aliens. Oh, no, no, no. I got to go to work in the morning. I don't need to. I don't need that kind of an interruption. Oh, you'll be back before work. Don't don't kid yourself. <laughs> They'll have you back. You know? Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll pass on it unless I get to drive the ship. Uh, I've been working on my mental. I, I, I want to I want to meet the flight of the navigator robot. That's the that's the one I would get inside of. Total compliance. Yep compliance compliance you know what it's funny you mention that because for a long time i've been saying that that is in my opinion one of the top two ufo movies out there you know i mean even with the early cgi that they were using the fact that they really in 1986 were calling the consciousness aspect of everything to do with this this phenomena is unbelievable it really is Denim. It has a lot. I gotta get you to hold on because Mr. Bumblefoot is playing, and we are down one hour, two hours to go here on Spaced Out Radio from UFO TikTok. It is Dan Warren, and you want to definitely check out his channel, Fifth Pillar of Emphasis. If you haven't subscribed yet, go hit that follow button. 
on TikTok. Space Out Radio continues right after this. Doing very well, buddy. Oh, thank you very much. And I do believe experience, experience, experiencers, but I just don't know which ones to believe and which ones not to believe. That's why I need that filter. And I need guys like you to have those conversations with the people that are claiming, making those claims because oh, sure. you Put it all have on the us. ability. Yeah. And I hope you understand my perspective as oh, well. Yeah. If it hadn't happened to you, you have to understand that. I hope. Oh yeah, a- absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's uh, oh, Grantavius now following you on Twitter. I mean, on uh, on uh, TikTok. So good. nice. Get a number of ours. Do you want to go refill your glass? Yes, please. I'm sorry. It's clicking. The ice is clicking around in there. No worries. I'll be right back. No worries. I wish I had some ice cubes in here. Mm hmm. Oh, hey, Clam. Thanks for the. Uh, I can I can I can pronounce that one. Wow. Mr. Cowley, dun, dun, dun. welcome back to the show. Oh, Mr. Cowley, dun, dun, dun. loves his spaced out radio. There you go. That's for Chad Smith right there. Hello, Terrence. Hey, Terrence, are you still at the same phone number? Let me make sure I still got you in my phone, buddy. Yes, I do. Do you still have the same phone number? Could you let me know? Cool. I'll try and shoot you... uh, a call here in the next few days, buddy. Do some catch up. Yeah, that's the one I got, Terrence. Cool. Be off, you flat earther. How you doing? Didn't I see that? Um... Ben and Joe are doing a flat earth episode tonight. I think I saw that that pop up on my YouTube. That was big Willie. Was it? Yeah. Big Willie was taking on the flat earthers tonight. So one of my favorite rappers is named K Reno. He's out of Texas and he has a song called flat versus globe. And he, he, he pretends to be both sides of the argument it's phenomenal. That guy is one of the most underrated lyricists that's ever been. He, it's, it's great. Everybody should go listen to that after this show. It's pure gold. Sorry, I'm just catching up here with everything. I actually do get behind. I do get behind. I have to hide the comments because they're so distracting when we're when I'm trying to have a conversation because I want to listen to the question and try to think through my response and seeing all these things pop up really is difficult for me. Oh, dude, it's totally difficult. I get screwed up at times. Totally get screwed up at times. Do you have a moderator or anything that helps you out with this or is it just no, a one-man band? It's me. You know what, though? You, you, you start to get little ways to help yourself out. Like for instance, questions in capital letters. Um, That one really, really helps. Um, That one is a massive, massive um, addition for what I do. Um, I rely on my mods. I I mean, I, I don't forget, you know, like on the camera this is why like when i'm looking i could see if i if i angle myself right i'm looking at you and i'm looking at the chat room at the same time and that's the beautiful part of using streamyard is i'm always looking and watching you know so you get uh, what really smartens you up though is get hit with trolls a few times the troll one you know 
And that started early in my blog talk radio days when I used that shit program. Right? In blog talk radio when we started out. And um, and it got to the point where blog talk uh, hackers were getting into our show like once to twice a week. So they would like override the audio or yeah. something or all of a sudden, shut it down? All of a sudden you'd hear this voice come on and some of the rudest, crudest things you've ever heard. I always default to, I wish these people that do these horrible things could use their powers and abilities for good. Like if they just harnessed that creativity and skill and yeah. did some good in the world, the world would be a much better place. Well, the only good part about blog talk radio was their phone number would pop up. So a lot of the trolls, you could actually, if they called your show, uh, you could actually call them back and rip them a new one. Right. I bet you were pretty good at that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was the early days. The old days. The hey, age. John Poe, I wanted to say thanks for the compliment that just scrolled by. I appreciate it, man. You are watching the chat room. Look at you. I, I, only during the commercial breaks. I can't I can't focus during the show. All right. Hold on one second. got 15 seconds. A big thank you to Noble Patrick, Cable Guy Matt, Todd, and Cat Chaser for the amazing Super Chats. The Super Chat is a fantastic way to support what we do on this show as well. Go to our store on our website. Get yourself some swag. I want a picture for my website here. Come on, let's do this. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. We really appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth, I want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. What do we got? Otherworldly. Otherworldly is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight looking at UFO TikTok. Dan Warren is with us. His TikTok is fifth pillar of emphasis. He's got over 64,000 subscribers looking in on what he is talking about when it comes to UFOs, UAP, and every story in between. It's very incredible what he's doing, a totally different look at ufology as we know it dan welcome back thanks again dave for having me oh it's a pleasure man total pleasure now i want to focus on this part of the show because earlier on i stated you don't consider yourself a researcher you consider yourself a man who's passing on information and then letting your subscribers your friends that you call them on on TikTok to be family, their family or family. I apologize to be their own judges to the news. You know why did you once again take this angle? Uh, because of Lou Elizondo, I, I I hate to keep going back to it, but when he was uh, making his when he had his interview with uh, I think it was Andy on that UFO podcast, that's what he was shouting. He was saying, "Look, I'll give I'll put information out there, but you have to think for yourself." So I'm echoing that with my channel and saying, I'm going to give you the information I have. I'm going to give you some background information that goes along with it in context so that you can make as, as informed of a decision about what to think about this particular aspect of the topic as possible. Okay. So taking along that line, you obviously have an opinion of what is going on in the UFO world. You know, what do you think is happening right now? Is this all completely governmental? Is it something that you believe there's a narrative going on, like many of us do project is going on? What's your stance on that? Um, so if if I was, 
I, I do make sports analogies Me every too. now and then. I can understand so, those. So if I was going to try to win the championship and whatever sport it is, the most dangerous person to have on the other team is someone that leaves my team because they're going to know the playbook. They're going to be able to thwart my efforts because they're going to be able to say they're about to run this play. Let's get in this position. I know exactly what they're thinking. That's what I see happening with Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon, that they are, I believe they're honest and trying their best to try to push this subject forward. Um, I, I don't have enough information to say if there's some behind the scenes stuff that I'm not some shenanigans that I'm not aware of. I'm, I'm not aware of them. So I, I, I until something shows me that there's something there, I'm going to keep, I have no de- reason to doubt them, but I think that they are working the playbook. They're telling us what they're doing, going to do. They're implementing it. Like I'm the fifth pillar of emphasis because he has a five pit that Lou and Chris have come up with a five pillar approach to this topic that they've been implementing since 2017 and the fruits of their labor are obvious at this point. So I think that Lou, Chris, and several other people are doing their best to push this effort forward out of the, I'll say the goodness of their heart. That's, that's the way that I see it. I feel like Lou's a trustworthy individual. I feel the same way about Chris. I think their heart's in the right place. If there's some manipulation going on that they're not aware of behind the scenes, then it might be there, but I don't have any proof to show that. Right. Do you not subscribe to the fact, like give me an example. You came into this four years ago. I'm almost seven years. Within that three years difference, the entire phenomena and the way people follow this subject has changed drastically. All right. I was always told by a lot of the veterans who who came came in and been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, whether it's Lorian Fenton, Melinda Leslie, Grant Cameron, all three of them really took me under their wings, as well as a, a few others. But I was always taught, never trust a spook. Once a spook, always a spook. And if you're talking to a spook, make sure you keep their information at an arm's length distance because they will try and pull the wool over your eyes. So the way things have changed is here we are supposed to be believing that all of these spooks like Elizondo, like Melon, like others, whom I agree, I think are, are pushing the narrative very, very well to get this out to the public. But we really don't know what the full intention is to that. So do you have any concern about that And I'm going to rephrase this a little bit by saying the big question that I'm trying to figure out is why now? Why now does this, is this topic so important? What's your opinion? So, so we can't separate the Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo's of the world from the, the, the bigger picture as well. It's not just them stating that something's happening. It's president Obama getting on TV and talking about UFOs and aliens. It's multiple high level people in high ranked positions, current and former that are coming out and saying things. Bill Nelson is running NASA and is talking about life outside of earth and it's, it's interact possible interactions with us. To me, it seems like we have reached a point of critical mass and the government was more or less going to try to keep it under wraps for as long as possible. But Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon said, we can try to expedite this process. And that's what I feel like we're seeing. And now it's become more like Lou fell on the sword, in my opinion, like he, he took one for the team and uh, the guy's health is suffering from it. His uh, retirement fund, I'm sure is taking a beating from what he's done. So more than, you know, Yeah. So I feel that he's trying to move this issue forward just for, because we don't need to keep it under wrap. Um, What's uh, Tim Burchett is the Congressman from Tennessee that I've had on the UCR. He knows that there's a cover up. John Greenwald knows that there's a cover up. Are we, are, are we trying to solve what's driving the UFOs? Are we trying to eliminate the cover up? That's what I think is going on right now is 
lose attacking the 70 year cloud of cover up that's been in the United States government because they're not going to do it voluntarily. But you can't you can't fight that entire system if you're only going back to 2004. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think it's a new phenomenon. Like, I'll tell you right now, the most fascinating aspect of this phenomenon is the depth in history that it goes back to with and that's that's my uh, that would be when my two worlds collide of things that I'm incredibly interested in are, the, are mankind's ancient history. We're a species with amnesia, I believe. Who knows what happened before the Younger Dryas catastrophe that occurred 12,000 years ago? So what what out there that is associated with this UFO phenomena is also associated with our ancient history? That's what I want to know. That's the big question that I have is where where did it first start? And it ain't 2004. It ain't 1947. It's it was way further back than that. But what is that? When did that happen? What's what's the difference in the change? I know the atomic bomb has made an impact for some reasons. Uh, that I don't know the answer to, but it's uh, it seems like there's an obvious signal that was sent by us detonating those at Trinity. No, definitely, and and I fully can understand that. I just don't know where this is taking us. The why now aspect of everything that we have, and, you know, whether it's NASA and don't even get I I'm, I'm debating whether or not to even bring up NASA with you because you know nothing pisses me off more than what we are seeing out of NASA right now. It honestly, it, it has, it makes my blood boil and curdle. Like I want to go in there as a regular human being. And I want to shake these people for now trying to get and hop in on the UFO phenomena when they've been partially to blame for a lot of this, when their own astronauts are coming out saying, yeah, there's UFOs up there. Yeah, every launch has been followed by UFOs. So, see, I'm firing up right now. I'm totally firing up. You know, and now I forgot what I, where I was totally going with this. I'm blaming you for this, Dan. Gordon Cooper is the guy for me that I'm like, I'll, I'll, that guy's telling the truth. Whatever that guy says, I'm buying because he seems like one of the most truthful individuals that that I've come across. Well, the late doctor, said, the late doctor Ed, Edgar Mitchell too. Oh yeah, and there are others, right? It just it doesn't make sense for me. You know, we're going down this NASA road, so let's just take it because it's pretty fresh news. You know that that you know, they're coming out. Well, we're going to get into this. We we've talked to the fighter pilots. How about your own astronauts, you jerk? You know, and I mean that facetiously, the jerk thing. I'm not saying that insultingly. You know, I mean, what about the astronauts? What about all the all the clips from the International Space Station that you see something weird flying by and all of a sudden the signal goes poof, off? What about the idea that that many from NASA have claimed that they have been washing photos since the Apollo missions? I mean, there, Carol Rosen, is that what I think she was one of them? There was a few of them. There was a few of them who were washing photos of craft on, in, the, in the sky or up in space. If we could take their words for it. They have no proof. We just have a story. Okay. But the fact is, NASA out of anybody should be a leader in this. And I think Bill Nelson is forcing their hand. Like, I don't think NASA would volunteer to do what they're doing right now. I think that Bill Nelson is stepping in as an appointed administrator. He wasn't elected by NASA individuals and he is shaking things up. He is saying what he's asking the same questions as you're asking, probably just in a board meeting instead of on SOR. Well, I no, I, and I understand that. And one guy can or cannot make a difference. But all of this top secret stuff that's going on, I want to know, did Neil Armstrong say on the security channel, they are here, they are on the hill, and they are watching us? All right? Yeah, or, I want to know that. Or the other craft that astronauts saw. Or the fact that NASA personally has filmed almost every launch they've had has been followed and tracked by UAP. We need to know this. They already know. 
So spill the beans. Don't play stupid on it. I think that's what pisses me off the most. Yeah. I, I also want to know what's in the bowels of the Vatican. There's a, there's a library over there with all kinds of amazing information that we probably would be shocked to learn some of the details of. What do they know about our ancient history? What do they know about interactions with another intelligence between us and hum, uh, humanity and them? Have, have, they, have we been guided? They might know some of that stuff. There might be answers in their basement. Who knows? I totally agree. Let's get to a question from Nicole here before we go any further. She is asking, what is the wooiest topic in ufology you want to know more about? Uh, for me, it would be uh, another one of the my two worlds colliding would be the relationship between, I think his name is Stan Gordon. He is made a good argument for a relationship between Bigfoot and UFOs. To me, that's the wooiest topic that I would love to know more about. Uh, the orbs that are associated with Bigfoot as well, that they're the light, I think some people call it. Is that what we're seeing? Is that what does the light represent that is associated with the Bigfoot phenomena? And I, I'm an avid listener to Sasquatch Chronicles. So Wes is uh, doing a great job and he is reaching over into the woo section of his uh, investigation further and further. And there's missing time. There's flashes of light and cloaking going on or, or vanishing of, of Bigfoot uh, that he's had people recount on his show. Are the, are the two, like if there's some, a lot of similarities between the two, are they related? Like that's the wooiest topic that I'm dying to know more about. Yeah. The Vatican is amazing. I mean, I want to know. I want to know. Come on, Catholics. Let's get this thing going. There's a billion and a half of you on the planet. Let's put some pressure on old Francis there. You know, instead of him walking around giving a few of these to everybody, let's open up some books in that library to see what you got or open up the the archives of the basement. That's what well, we need. The, the Catholic religion has been more proactive in addressing the alien issue than any other religion that I'm aware of. They've, they put on presentations and events discussing it and they're putting one on, on November 10th that you can go to for free. You can go sign up. It's at the Washington national cathedral and it includes, um, I think it's it's called with scientists looking for evidence of extraterrestrial life. What does that mean for our our the future of our religious views? That's coming up on November 10th, and it's going to include people like Avi Loeb, who's running the Galileo Project. It's going to include Bill Nelson, and just like three four days ago, Avril Haines, who is the sitting director of National Intelligence hopped on and she's going to be a speaker at this Washington national cathedral event about what does alien life mean for our religious future. It's freaking the DNI is going to be at this thing. And she's responsible. Her office was responsible for the preliminary assessment from the UAP task force. That blows my mind. I, and I can't believe more people aren't talking about that, to be honest. All right. Anonymous Rex. Thank you for the super chat. Really do appreciate it. What are your thoughts on the 2019 Bainbridge Island Tic Tac event that took place just days before the events witnessed by the USS Omaha? The Bainbridge one is new to me. So I, if you know about it, you're going to have to fill in the blanks for me. I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry, Anonymous Rex. And I'll apologize too. I was not familiar with this one. I really wasn't. But thank you anyways, my friend. Thank you anyways for it. We will try and find it out. I'll so try and I, find it during the break. I did, um, once again, on Sasquatch Chronicles, there was a gentleman that called in with some experiences, and he was up in the upper peninsula of the Mitten State, Michigan, and he recounted a story of him and his son going fishing on this remote lake where they always, like their family owned this land. They go out there const uh, very frequently, and they were in this rowboat because there's no motorboats allowed. It's that small that, uh, of a lake. And he said he rowed across, and it was about 300 yards away from where he launched. And his son turned and looked back, and he said, what is that? And they turned around and looked. And he said it was a, 
I think 12 to 14 foot long propane tank looked just like one in your backyard on the surface, just inches above it. And the water was perfectly glass clear. And it was just floating at about three to five miles per hour crossing this river or crossing this lake. And he actually took a picture of it with this phone, but it's so far that you can't see much detail of it, but you can see there's a white object there. And he said that the tic tac it's a tic tac. Uh, it's a, a 14 foot long tic tac. Basically, if it's described as a propane tank, he says it went over to the shore and it didn't elevate and go up. It just went right through the trees and into the woods. And that was something that made me think, well, if they can, if they're trans medium travel vehicles, if they can go through water, they could go through trees, I would assume. And if they can go through trees or navigate them, at least think about how many things could be hiding in our forest. All they got to do. Uh, it, it's so hard to see 50 yards in front of you when you're in there, you can't see anything from the sky. Like that's another good hiding spot. If they if felt the need to hide. Oh, very true. Very true. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize, Anonymous Rex, that we could get better answers for your question, but uh, we will try and get more information on that. we got about three minutes to go before we have to go to break at the top of the hour. Let's go to another question from Hell Yeah, Dude. Can our guest, which is you, Dan, tell us why he thinks aliens keep abducting people if it's such an old phenomena? Um, all right, here's my pet theory. This one... I don't know the answer to this one, but I got a pet theory. Uh, maybe they have bred out the interesting aspects of our personalities. Maybe they have minions. Maybe the greys are their minions. And the, every now and then they have to abduct people to inject some liveliness into them. And they end up with what you get in the minions movie. Like we provide a little bit of interest because of our strange personalities to a, a very bland gray. Maybe we are uh, just interesting in the way that we think and act around them. Maybe that's why. And they just need to replenish the stock that they have before it, it goes away too long. But uh, all right, I'll, I will say this though, the Paracas skulls, that's another thing that I'm fascinated with because I wonder if that is a example of a hybrid uh, Brian Forrester's leading the way on the research on the, that particular aspect of it. And those things are out of this world. When you look at them, the older they get, the more, the larger the heads are, the larger the eyes are, they don't look human to me. Uh, they have, they have definite features that are not waterboarding. They are born that way. That's DNA. That's, that's heredity. Uh, so maybe that's why, maybe there's examples of it going back that far. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's just a survival. Maybe their DNA stock needs to be replenished every now and then. I think they check DNA and lineage. There's something to, to do about that because they probably know as we, as humans, we die off as we get older and our body parts start to die off. And you know, when you're older, you're not circulating blood as much anymore. And I think what they do is they follow the lineage in order to keep that strand of DNA that they may need or use or sperm or or f eggs from a female. I, I think it has something to do with that. I really do. So, I mean, that's my opinion as to why it continues to go on. I'm not sure about the whole RH negative blood. I just don't get that. Could be. But I think the lineage portion of everything really helps them tap into uh, the DNA that they need for any type of hybridization type program. That's my theory. Could be wrong, but I don't know. Maybe. I yeah. haven't figured that one out yet. Let's see here. We've got about 20 seconds left, so I'm not going to get into any more questions here before... We have to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. But we are having a great show tonight with Dan Warren. And you want to follow him on Twitter. And all you got to do is go to at Hey Look over there. That's L-U-K for look. Hey Look over there. But the big thing is, yeah, it's his TikTok account. 64.3 thousand subscribers, followers at the fifth pillar of emphasis. Make sure you go check him on out. We're going to get into more UFO stories 
Getting the UFO news. Dan already pissed me off about NASA. I don't know if I'll keep going there. We'll figure it out. Dan Ward continues on Spaced Out Radio right after this. All right, we're clear. And your your ability to time the breaks is admirable. Like I'm sitting here thinking two minutes. Can I stretch this top this response out for that duration of time? I can't time it. I thought I thought I was pretty close, but it seemed like I it was uh, maybe fifty percent there. Everything's on that clock there. See that little light flashing there? This is a behind the scenes look, guys. You gotta check out this video. Yeah, that's the behind the scenes. Right there. That's the one where that controls life. That tells me what I'm doing and what I'm not doing right. So red is uh, good or red is bad? No, red is good when it's flashing because it tells me, it gives me a countdown on time, which is good. How's your throat? Uh, it's doing better. It's calmed down. I think I've got, uh, I, I think I've got the rest of this show in, in me. No problem. Good, good. All right, so I'll ask another question to the uh, commenters. And well, first of all, does does anybody here in the comments from my TikTok channel? I made a video and I put it up trying to advertise for this. Uh, as soon as you put that thumbnail out, um, I, it didn't get a lot of views. I'm convinced that if you say the word YouTube in your TikTok video, they like suppress the views as much as they can because they don't want you to get off of the get off of the app. But uh, my question is, would you guys rather see a Bigfoot, a UFO, or another cryptid of some sort, uh, if, if you could choose one? I didn't say alien, because that's a little too personal, uh, but a UFO from a distance. I'm dying to see a Bigfoot doing something athletic. I want to see like the stories that they talk about, like how fast they can run, how they can jump how much strength they have. That's something that I'm dying to see. Like that, That's the one for me. I see one Bigfoot, the two Bigfoots. All right, if if it's if you want to see a cryptid, what cryptid would it be besides a Bigfoot? Bigfoot getting out of a UFO is a good one. I want to see a gnome. A gnome? The little people, like the fairies, like that's some crazy stuff. There's stories that go way back talking about Dude, those things. My entire area, almost every older house around here has a fairy garden. I, nice. a couple of years ago on my, I, I said this uh, story before on my, on my fence posts, I actually saw two fairies, one sitting on one fence post and another sitting on another fence post. They were all lit up. We don't have fireflies here. Strange. Yeah, dude. I, I just saw uh, one of the sweetest people on UFO Twitter pass through here. Uh, Farrell, where, where, where are you at? Uh, Pop up. I can't see where you're. Julie Farrell. I just saw her yeah, pop lu- up in lus- here. Lus- luscious jewels she's known around here. Yes. She's so nice. She's Such a amazing. nice person. She's amazing. She really is. Fantastic hair, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who just popped in here? Um, I swore I just missed. Uh, Gnome Squatch. There we go. Our friend Gnome Squatch is here. Uh, Filth Wants Mothman. That'd be a good one. Ooh. That'd be terrifying. Yeah. L- red eye, glowing red eyes. L wants to see a Wendigo. Ogopogo for Keiju, which I think is a sturgeon. Uh, Menahune for Anonymous Rex. Uh, Mukele and Bimbo is another one of my favorite ones. I'd like to see the Bikili Babembe. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see that one. And let's see. I'd like to see a gnome squatch. Looks like I just did. Yeah. I'd like to see little people. There's little people up here. So a lot the the First Nations band that lives their reservations about an hour away. Some of the most beautiful people you could even ever meet. I was talking to one of the elders, a former chief there one day, and he was telling me a story about about the little people that come down from the mountain. And I said, "Well, Kim can you show me where they are? Because I really want to see one. He goes, well, there's a village up on the mountain. I'm like, really? I said, have you seen it? He goes, no, my brother has. 
he goes, we can take, take the four by fours. We could go up to the mountain. When, when the road ends, we have to get out of the vehicle. We're going to be met by the great grizzly bear spirit. The great grizzly bear spirit will tell us whether or not we're allowed to continue the hike up the mountain to the village of the little people. And I haven't gone yet. What's keeping you? Contact. A lot of the First Nations, they'll give you the information, and then you won't hear from them for a long time. You know, because they're very protective. And I don't blame them. I was about to say, yeah, I'd be a little defensive if I was them as well. Big thank you to Rex, Andrew, Nicole, Patrick, Cable Guy, Matt, Todd, and Cat Chaser for the Super Chats. Here we go. Through the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. Dave Scott is my name. I'm the man behind the microphone at SORHQ. Let's do this thing, shall we? I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio and do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, check out our swag, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and so much more. You can follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. From TikTok and the UFO section, this channel is called Fifth Pillar of Emphasis. Dan Warren is his name. He's got over 64,000 subscribers on TikTok, introducing them to all the latest UFO news. Dan, welcome back. Thanks for having me. If you want to look me up on TikTok, you can just search UFO. I think I'm fortunate enough to be the number one result as far as users go. Nice. Very nice. That's good hard work, my friend. Good hard work. All right, let's continue on here because there has been a lot of UFO news and perusing your channel here. You know, what are some of the big questions that your audience and your followers have for you when it comes to this subject? Uh, Well, I mean, the number one question I get asked is have you ever seen a UFO? And we already addressed that. So uh, right. uh, other than that, uh, I get a lot of, well, what do you think they are? And there's a gentleman on Twitter known as Ras- Rasmussen Berlinghoff, who has put an infographic together about the origins of the possible origins of UAPs. And it runs the gamut. So uh, a lot of times they'll ask me questions about, do you think it's interdimensional? Do you think it's crypto terrestrial or whatever it is? And I can refer to his document. I do quite regularly and just try to explain it to people like, hey, here's why I feel this way. Or this particular aspect of it ties into this conversation that we're having right now. Like the if, if it can vanish. Well, that to me speaks of an interdimensional aspect of it. Uh, if it is like a uh, over reproductive overtone type of an encounter. Well, that leads me to the crypto terrestrial. So a lot of people just are trying to get their heads around what the possibilities are. And there's a lot of possibilities out there. I want to ask you in regards to that same type of subject, are people more believing now? Do you, do you get a lot of skeptics still kind of trolling their way through? I had one gentleman named Jose that would uh, mock me every single video for a solid three months, uh, but he quit on me. Like I, he was my number one troll and he quit on me. So I'm a little disappointed. I haven't heard from him in a while, but yeah, there's some people that will uh, drag me through the mud because of just being, because of the stigma associated with this topic, which one of the comments that kind of cracked me up is that someone was like, dude, you need to get a hobby like this is terrible. And I'm, I turned around and responded by stating, this is my hobby, man. Thanks for the encouragement. Like, this is what I do as my hobby. Like I am, I'm an active father. I'm an active husband. I have a career. I do a lot. This is what I enjoy doing in my free time. This is my hobby. And and ufology to me is a fun endeavor because I don't have to try to be interested in it. It comes naturally. It's that curiosity. It keeps me going. 
It's it's just like uh, if you ever go creek fishing, it's not where you're fishing that's the most exciting part of doing it. It's what's around the next corner. Is there another? Is there a bigger fish around the corner? So you keep walking and walking and walking. That's what I feel like I'm going through with this ufology investigation is what's next. It's always what's next. That is the carrot being dangled in front of me. And it's enjoyable. It's great. It's a fun ride. We have talked about experiencers. We've talked about kind of the government side of everything. Is there a mystery, whether it's a crashes? Let's talk about UFO crashes here. The mystery of UFO crashes. What do you think we have? In the news that you've read and you've caught up on, because I know you're always reading and you're always lurking on it, where is the information there? What do you think we have? What's hiding? So uh, I'll address your question, but I will say one thing about TikTok that took me by surprise is when I got into TikTok, I never thought it would make me read more. I read so much more information now because of my videos, because of trying to put content out that's accurate than I did before. Uh, but let's get back to the question you asked. Can you run that one by me one more time? Well, crash retrievals, what do you think they're hiding? All right. So when it comes to crash retrievals, I feel like there is a lot of conflicting information and data points. I really struggle with crash retrievals. If we are looking at these, uh, bismuth magnesium layered, at the atomic level, small pieces, if that's what we're focusing on so hard, why, how could we possibly have a crashed intact vehicle? If, if, if we're focusing on the scraps that are left behind by, by wreckage. So I have a real hard time swallowing the fully functional uh, UFO craft. If, if we had one, surely we would have gleaned some technology off of it. That would be providing us with domination the world's never seen before militarily like that's what it boils down to that's what humans are going to do with anything that we get we're going to try to weaponize it unfortunately that's just our uh it's probably why we're not invited to the intergalactic picnic very often but i i have a hard time believing that we have a craft that we have the ability to figure anything out about it my guess is if we do which of of all the different possibilities, like the crash doesn't seem to be as plausible to me as a archeological discovery, which has been hinted at uh, multiple times in the past by multiple different people. That's the one to me, like if there was a, if a, a ship that was abandoned, cause that's a common tactic with the military, they are not going to take everything back with them. If it's not the right decision to make financially or logistically. So if, if they left a craft behind, never thought anyone would find it. And we found it. That's how I would think that we would be able to come across one, but I'm guessing at that, just like I'm guessing at everything else. Well, and that's a big guess. I mean, your opinion is you don't think we have that technology and that there are no secrets yet. Somebody like Lou Elizondo is basically saying, yeah, we, we do have them. You know, I mean, if you believe Bob Lazar, there's at least nine of them that are here. I mean, at what point do you kind of open up your eyes and say, look, there, there's something to this. I, I better investigate this more. Yeah, I, my understanding of what Lou has said is we have pieces. Like, I don't think he's, I didn't interpret what he said is we have an intact craft. So that to me is where I, uh, <clears throat> it's hard for me to make that jump to to a fully intact craft but like you said bob lazar comes up in conversations frequently in the comment section and it, that's a another one that i have a real hard time wrapping my mind around because of all the contradictions associated with the entire accumulation of data from that inter from his interviews from his stories from all the investigations that have taken place it, there's just so much contradicting information when it comes to crash retrievals. And uh, I'll, I'll ask you this question because this one gets asked to me constantly. If they can travel that far, why are they crashing? Like that's, that's one of my number one questions that I get in the comment section whenever I talk about crash retrievals. Well, the theory of Roswell was that there were two crashes that day. There was one in, in Roswell and there was one in <clears throat> San Augustine. And the belief was stormy weather, combined with the, the amount of radar that 
was going on in Nevada, in New Mexico at the time that really maybe screwed with their own radar or whatever they have on their UFO craft. And that's why they collided. One crashed in San Augustine and the other one crashed in Corona. That's the theory that Stanton Friedman had been looking at. You know, so, I mean, hey, everybody has technological problems. Nobody says just because you could travel through wormholes to get here, it doesn't mean that they don't have their own technological problems every now and again. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm also, uh, my response to that type of question is usually that an aircraft carrier can travel great distances very reliably. You don't hear about aircraft carriers crashing, so they can transverse fast distances. But it's the jets that deploy from them that you hear about crashing. So maybe that's like, I don't think every UFO we see is capable of interstellar travel. Maybe they, that's where the mothership comes into play. Like maybe there's a mothership in the ocean that can jump to a different dimension or, or get somewhere far off in the distance. But I don't think every craft could. And, and maybe it's a Pinto version. Maybe they, maybe they don't have the best technology deployed in these small ones because they don't think they need it. It's not, it's not something that is going, uh, it's not a function that is required for them to accomplish their goals with whatever that craft's purpose is. Is there a UFO case that you believe is, uh, and I'm saying prior to the Nimitz encounter moving forward, so prior to 2004, is there a case that sits with you or resonates with you or bugs you that you wish there was more information on? Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of USOs and Shag Harbor to me is the one that, man, I wish there was more information about that available and that there would be, of course you wish you could go back in time and be there, witness it. Oh, but yeah. that one to me had so much information, but I know there was stuff going on. I say, I know I've read, I've heard that there's stuff that was going on with the military investigating it, scuba divers being in the water. What did those guys see? That there that had to have been a phenomenal week. I mean, think about the duration of time that that event took place over. What a crazy time to be witnessing something like that. That's the one for me. Well, the rumor about <laughs> Shag Harbor was that the divers went in, Canadian divers went in, and they saw a secondary craft with beings on the outside fixing the first craft. And it nobody saw that second craft come in. It came in underwater. And then the theory goes, the next day, both craft were gone. And, yeah. no, and nobody saw them leave through the air. It's so, a phenomenal story. And I, I don't know if, like, that's the one that I don't think the younger generation is very familiar with. That's yes. the one that, that's the gold standard to me. Like, such a small town out of the middle of nowhere, this thing comes in and rocks their world. See, what I would love to see is I would love to see somebody from Discovery Channel, much like a couple of years, ago, years ago, they did the series with Richard Branson on the deep blue hole of Belize. And I would love to see them take a submarine down to the coordinates because we know where the coordinates are. We know where this where this vehicle was, and I would love to see them go into that area with a, a submarine or a rover in that area to see if there is any debris that is lying there. Now, of course, the currents are very strong in that area. You would have to expand your field of view, and it's been 50 years, but I would love to see one of those submarines go down there. What if there's a piece of this craft sitting there that the military didn't recover? It happened at Roswell. When they cleaned up the mess, there were still parts, you know, buried a foot, two feet underground that people got with metal detectors. Happened at San Augustine. It's happened at every crash site. And yet that's a total television special. That would generate a lot of money, to be honest, for, for Discovery Channel. So if anybody from Discovery is listening, I want credit. <laughs> I want credit on that. But I would love to see that, though, man. 
And could you imagine if all of a sudden you pull out, you know, a, a two, three foot chunk of a bare metal that you don't know, and it tests not to be from here? That would be huge. Absolutely. Like mm. uh, that shark in your background it reminds me of the Max Hawthorne interview that you had. Oh, he scared the daylights out of me. That is that is my favorite podcast you've had. Like he I am a, a big I've become a big fan of Max Hawthorne because of the way that he carries himself and speaks so eloquently as well as the information he transfers. But to me, I think that there should be more focus on the underwater UFO aspect of this phenomenon than there is. And I think Max is the guy that could easily transition from looking for cryptids and unusual and, and for witness sightings stories that he's heard about cryptids in the, in our oceans to transferring that over to, Hey, have you ever seen any unusual objects in the water that you can't explain that were on sonar? Like I'm, I would love to reach out to him and just kind of pick his brain on it. Well, you've heard about these unusual animals. Have you heard about any unusual objects in, in the water? He could be a resource. He could be full of information like that. Yeah, he scares me. He just scares me. Is it because he has cats and you have dogs? Is that no, one no, of the I reasons? got three cats. No, no, it, it's the fact that there. Are, he was talking about these when I was talking about megalodon because I still believe megalodon exists. He was talking about these super sharks that are out there. That you know, you, your average great white, a big one, gets up to you know between. 15 and 20 feet. The females grow larger than the males. But then he was talking about these, these super sharks that are out there that are causing massive bites in whales, you know, and, and other great whites that they're finding with bite marks. And they're measuring between 30 and 40 feet. Well, that's getting into Megalodon territory, man. That's getting big. Yeah. You know, who knows what's in our oceans? Like it's so unexplored and mm -hmm. we don't have the ability to investigate it. That's why right. I think there's a lot of growth or not growth potential, a lot of possibilities that we could find some very interesting stuff associated with the phenomena in our waters. See, for me, my UFO story that I would love to learn more about is the Phoenix Lights. And we're going to have Dr. Lynn Katai coming on in a few nights time to talk about this, but I would love to know more about that because I feel so bad for the citizens of Phoenix and Mesa and in that entire area, Apache Junction, where we broadcast on the Rattler. Okay. I would love to go into that a little bit more because those people saw things. They saw big, big craft flying over their areas before it got dark. Even and, Five Simonton saw something, and he did not. He had to turn around and deny it and ridicule everyone. Mm -hmm. And but he knew something was going on. But that's the thing, man. I would love. I would love to interview Fife Simonton, and I would like to ask him the one question I want to ask him more than anything: Did the government put you up to that press conference, or did the military put you up to that press conference? Because, yeah, pre because pressure had to have been applied from somewhere. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And I don't buy the fact that it's jet flares. I don't buy the fact that that big triangle that we've all seen the video on was helicopters or A-10 Thunderbolts flying in formation. I don't buy that whatsoever. Right? Something big happened there. Let's learn the truth. You know, and we and we had Kurt Russell in the air reporting on it as he was trying to get into the Phoenix airport. How much more legit could you get? Exactly. I mean, with hair like Kurt Russell's, do you think he's going to lie? Absolutely. That guy has got to be, uh, he, he's, he plays superheroes in the movies. So you got to trust the guy that plays superheroes in the movies. They don't do anything wrong, right? Yeah, you got that right, my friend. You got that right. As we got about five minutes here before we're going to go to break here at the top of the hour. You know, there's a lot of spin going on 
in ufology, whether it's people trying to catch up or uh, catch, say, Lou Elizondo on on saying one thing on a one podcast, and he says something different on the other, whether it's a controversy about Tom DeLonge and his role in ATIP versus OSAP and everything in between. You know, what do you think is the biggest controversy that we are dealing with in ufology right now? Uh, the biggest controversy? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm trying to lose my voice again, I think. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the biggest controversy right now is going to be the differences between the ASAP or OSAP program and ATIP. What was, who was really calling the shots? Cause it does sound like John Lekatsky was the, the top guy in the Pentagon running the investigations, but Lou's claiming of course, that he was running the investigations, but it was just on the military side and a little bit more specific. So the comment that is in the Pentagon's at the Skinwalker Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book that just came out is Lekatsky saying that they were the only game in town. That to me is a tough shot across the bow, I guess I would say, uh, for Lou and his efforts while he was operating in the same arena at the same time. It, it I don't know how it can be viewed any other way, but uh, maybe I'm wrong. It could be. It could very well be. Uh, you know, I, I think for me, the biggest the biggest story is, where is this going? I still want to know the purpose. The purpose of this entire conversation. Because even going back to prior to the TTSA first coming out, there's been no reason as to why this topic, after 70 plus years of cover-up, needs to come out now. And I don't think it's because Elizondo quit his job or got frustrated or Chris Mellon was tired of, you know, trying to figure things out or John Podesta and his pressure or Hillary Clinton and, and the Rockefeller initiative. I don't think it was any of that. There has to be a major reason as to why they are now pushing this topic and I don't know what it is. My mind wants to say they've been given a date. They've been in contact and they've been given a date. Do you think that's possible? So it's funny that you should feel that way because on Thomas Fessler's podcast, Lou was on there just a week and a few days ago and they were asking him some questions and he referred to and about China. They were asking him about, well, what does China know about UFOs? And he said, well, it's it's interesting because they use artificial intelligence to track them. Uh, but what I find even more interesting is that in such a heavily controlled and restricted media apparatus that you find in China, the number one selling book is called The Three Body Problem. And if you know and he says, if you know what that book's about, you'll know why I find it interesting, because that's something that, that they could suppress. And I actually made a video on it because I didn't know what it was. And it's a story uh, written in 2006, and it's still, I looked it up, number one selling book in China right now. And it's about a group of researchers in the government that start to blast signals out into the galaxy. Well, there's a, there's a civilization on this planet that receives them, that receives that signal. And they happen to live in a solar system that has three suns. The three body problem is what occurs when three objects orbit around each other. It becomes very erratic and chaotic. So they're a planet being circle or circling around these three suns. It's a chaotic atmosphere. They have a lot of climate change. They can't predict what the weather is going to be like very well. They get a signal from earth. And so they say, that's a more uh, stable location than we're at. We're going to go there. They send a signal back and say, we're going to be there in 400 years. And so they start on their merry way. At the same time, they kneecap human advancement by, uh, well, when the signal gets there, uh, humanity kind of splits into different types of cliques. And some of them are welcoming of, of the aliens that are going to be coming. Some are vehemently, vehemently opposed to them. And some of them are on their side. So the ones that are on their side actually assist them with sending out a signal 
that inhibits, uh, that interferes with our most sensitive scientific equipment that prevents us from taking any further leaps forward in physics. So right. we can't advance. I'm going to get you to hold on there. We got Dan Warren for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. Then the fedora wearing John Hudson will come in for the unbiased UFO report. A jam packed hour number three of Spaced Out Radio coming up next on the Mighty SOR. I'm really loving this show, man. I let the clock run out. I'm mad at myself now. Oh, man, no, dang, I'm right. still working. Five minutes didn't seem like five minutes that time around. That's okay. Are you still having fun? Oh, yeah. It's a good time. I just, my voice is starting to get a little rough. So I'm sorry about all the clearing of throats okay. and sips of water. But man, hey, man, I am enjoying it. Good. Good. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up the chat and see what everybody's uh well talking about. Uh Chad Smith says, Daniel, don't talk shit about Chad Smith in the chat. Nobody can about talk me? I don't I don't I don't um, I don't usually have any negative things to say about people unless I know them personally and no. know I need to say something about them. No, it's uh Daniel in the chat room. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Chad Smith. Everybody loves Chad Smith. Oh, absolutely. Everybody wants to be Chad Smith. Yeah. And you can get your Chad Smith t-shirts by going to our Space Out Radio store. Yeah. We got Chad Smith t-shirts. The big wrench on there. Oh, yeah. Is the wrench an indicator that he's a moderator? Is that what that means? Yeah. Hey, Michael Huntington. How you doing? What's happening, buddy? First time in SOR? Who's that for, bud? Oh, that's my it's my first time in SOR that's, for sure. Well, I know yeah. it's your first time on the show. Yeah. That's awesome. It's a good time, man. Pam McSee wants to be a Chad Smith, but can't. You can always be a Chad Smith. Yeah, this is uh, Dan Warren's first time on the show, Mike. And uh, Andrew, though, says he's Chad Smith. Andrew and Gnomes Trucking Express. That's a strange combination of he's got he's got heights. Gnomes. How do you drive a truck if you're a gnome? That's a hard. Well, you got to put a lot of blocks on the pedals, right? Yeah, just like Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. What's that guy's name? The the little guy is it? Gadget? I can't remember what his name was. Thank you, owner. Appreciate you. Oh, Sonny says he's Chad Smith now with the wrench. OB says, thanks for explaining that book, Dan. I was curious about that. Yeah, you go to my YouTube or my TikTok channel and check it out because I I do a little bit better job explaining it there with some pictures of the book covers that go along with it as as well. Like that's the when you make a TikTok, you can make it perfect because you can record and if you don't like it, you record again. I get I can it's a three minute video, but sometimes it'll take me three minutes just get one five word sentence but uh out there without stumbling over my words michael Huntington says you do some great work on tiktok if you ever get a chance to talk to michael Huntington, he's one of the best dudes out there i've seen his name pop up on twitter here in just the last few days so i recognize the name but i can't i can't place him right now I can't place why I know it, what yeah, he's been you saying. You know what I love about Michael? He's one of these guys who asks very direct questions. He's not insultive he, unless he's insulted. You know what I'm saying? But he asks such pertinent questions, and people just jump all over him. And it drives me nuts because he'll have some pertinent questions that need to be answered. And... Nobody answers. Instead, they goon on up on him. Hey, Major Lee, how you doing? Obi, I'm 42, so yeah, you can uh, you can have it. Just 
your kid is going to make fun of your 10 year old is going to make fun of you for having a TikTok account. There, there's a stigma associated with TikTok still. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is funny. Dude, I'm in my 40s. Is it legal for me to have a TikTok? Thank God my son hasn't found TikTok yet. So my kids know I have TikTok and, but I'm like, do not tell your friends that like, don't show them my account. Cause they are going to rip on you. Like it's fine for you to watch them and everything, but your friends are, are just going to use it as ammunition to rip on you. So keep that to yourself. Our flat earther B Hoff. No wonder Dan is a glober. He uses a fisheye lens like NASA. Cause your <laughs> background looks bent. I, I have a Nexigo camera that I ordered off of Amazon when I first started trying to make those YouTube videos. I didn't, I don't know how to research a camera. It's tough. Can you edit on TikTok? Is that how you do them? Um, yeah, you can. There's different ways that you can make them. There, like I said, all the tools are there. You can do a lot of different versions of it. I use the green screen almost in solely like yeah that's the predominant thing i use because i can put i can put my background up which is usually information uh but that yeah you can edit things out you can modify it there there's all kinds of different tricks that you can do well like i said we're gonna meet with you soon looking forward <laughs> to it you you can also just make a video and the the native format of tiktok which is the vertical instead of horizontal yeah. and import it, upload it into TikTok. So you can make it on any video editing well, platform and then just upload. We'll talk about it. Dan Warren. Hold on. We're going to get going here. Thank you to all our super chatters tonight. Really appreciate you. Don't forget to shop at our store <laughs> on our website. Here we go with the third hour. Get your horns up. Here comes Bumblefoot. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you with us. My name is Dave Scott. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Otherworldly. Otherworldly is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, and check out our swag on social media. Follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, Dan Warren is with us. And if you're on TikTok you got to follow this guy. Fifth pillar of emphasis is his his YouTube, his TikTok channel. He's got over 64,000 followers so far and ever growing. Doesn't look like it's going to stop. So we appreciate you coming on in, Dan. Thank you so much. No problem. Glad to be here. All right. Let's get to the craft people are seeing. You know, one of the big arguments that we keep hearing from those who are allegedly in the know is that we don't know whether these are coming from space. We don't know if they're time travelers. We don't know if they are from the future, a different dimension that's figured out how to cross over into this dimension. What do you think's going on here? So everything that I keep hearing leads me towards the quantum mechanic realm. Um, What one thing that, kind of stood out to me was Kevin Day who was on the Princeton when he was when the Nimitz encounter occurred he, uh, I think in two that occurred in 2004 yes. in 2009 he wrote a book a, a fi- he fictionalized story of those events and put it in the National Congress or archives I can't remember exactly where and I read that book and it's just a short little blur uh, like 20 pages or so but the character that he describes 
it, he says it boils down to quantum mechanics is what was the explanation for what they were seeing. Every, Lou Elizondo is constantly talking about the quantum world, quantum physics, quantum mechanics. Tom DeLong has just come out and said that the UFOs operate on the borderline between quantum mechanics and consciousness. To me, there is a link that we need to try to figure out between the quantum realm and our consciousness. That's where I think the explanations for the UFOs are going to come from. Um, I've been, I've been batting about a hypothesis here lately. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer. I do HVAC a lot. There's a change of state is a very common terminology used in my field where when you go from steam to water, there's a release of energy at that change of state. When you go from water to ice, there's a release of energy at that change of state. So my current hypothesis is, is there a change of state that occurs between our physical world and our conscious world? And is that at the, is it just beyond the quantum realm that that occurs? If we dr drill down deep enough, do we eventually go from the quantum physics world to quantum consciousness through a change of state? And that's what UFOs are, are taking advantage of is the energy that it would require to go from one to the other. And that's how they're able to manipulate their craft the way that they do. Um, it's just something that I'm trying to wrap my head around. Uh, if you, if you look at a cup of ice, it has water in it, has ice in it. They're intertwined with each other. Is it possible that what we're seeing is two universes, one that is the physical side, which is the quantum side, and one that is the consciousness side? Would they be as above, so below? If if we have quantum consciousness and we have uh, quantum physics, do we have human consciousness and do we have human physical creatures does it go to the planetary scale? Does it go to the galactic scale? Is there a galactic consciousness that's also intertwined with our galaxies? Is it a universal consciousness? I, I, I'm just trying to figure out how the two are related. And at what point is there a crossover? Well, that's, that's the interesting part is where is that crossover? Because, you know, one of the issues that I've had with this entire phenomena is if they state that this craft ain't here, and if you notice over the last number of months, we've heard Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon stop using the words Russia and China in their conversations. And I, I think that was a huge step forward that not many people picked up on. Because the minute you eliminated Russia and China, which was in every conversation for the first three and a half years, I think it really opened up the fact that, okay, we're dealing with something that isn't from here. But something has to be piloting whatever that is. Whether it's a drone or whether there are little gray beings on these craft playing around with the military and people in general. So my question to you is, do you think we've been too naive about the fact that these Tic Tacs, these other craft people are seeing, whether it's black triangles, the boomerangs, the spaceships, the flying saucers, the cigar-shaped objects are pilotless? Well, back to Flight of the Navigator, there seems to be a consciousness connection to the craft that the, we hear a lot of people talk about the craft are alive. They're sentient. And that's where the transformers are as well. Like back to the, the beginning of the, my journey. Uh, do I think there's something in there? I think that I, I think that we're looking at a mixed bag of possible explanations. Some of them would have beings in them. Some of them would not. It depends on the task that that craft is assigned to perform. Those the triangles that are just going around and scanning things that I know of. I don't know or that I'm aware of. I, I haven't heard of anything that would make me think that there is somebody running a grid pattern, scanning the ground. That sounds like something an, an, an animatronic intelligence would want to do. Um, the situations where there's abductions and there's interactions with the beings, occupants and humans, obviously there's someone in the vehicle at that point. 
I think we have a plethora of different possibilities of what we're experiencing and some are going to have them. Some are not. Uh, Bob Lazar describes the sports model and he doesn't describe a bathroom. He doesn't describe a refrigerator in there. That's not something that an occupant is going to be in for any duration of time, just like our cars. So that's not some place that someone's living. Then we get reports of craft that are small, but then when they go inside the craft, they're like the TARDIS, just enormous on the inside football fields. That to me sounds like someplace you could live, that you would have a bathroom, that you would have a refrigerator, ways of keeping someone sustained while they're doing a, a biological creature sustained. Uh, you wouldn't need that if it was just an AI intelligence that's infused into the craft itself. And it's just a living sentient vehicle or uh, mechanism of some sort. You know, what always fascinates me about these craft is when you get people who claim they've been taken and they see like an orb of light outside their window. Right. But when they get in the craft, this thing is massive. Like they can go everywhere. Like it's the size of a shopping mall almost inside. You know, I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but you, you get the feeling of what I'm saying. You know, at some point, do you think the government may know about this kind of stuff, whether it's from places like Skinwalker Ranch or whether it's from other sources? Uh, possibly. I feel like the stove piping that goes on in the government is going to be a problem. It's just like what happened with 9-11. You're going to end up having a lack of communication between the different departments because they're in competition with each other. I would describe it similar to if your parents were going to allocate some money to all the kids in the family, you're going to compete with your brother to, to try to get more of that funding. That's what I feel like happens in our governments where they are all competing for the same limited resources. So they're not going to share the good stuff with someone else if they could use that to their advantage. Uh, I, I think that's a problem that we have and that's something that needs to be addressed by hopefully the, the office that replaces the UAP task force. Maybe we'll get some across the board information that will be shared more freely at that point. Fingers crossed. Is the public ready? Some of us, some of us are, some of us, some of us are absolutely not ready. It is going to be chaos. I'm, I, I'm sure that it's going to be chaotic when it's, publicly acknowledged by a high ranking member of the government. And I do think that it needs to come from the president. That would be my, the president of the United States is the person that I feel like needs to say it. I know that there's a lot of people that don't care what he has to say, but to me, that is a very important step. And I, I think it's irregardless of who the president is at the time that just that office needs to make a statement and be the one to open the door and, and, let the information out and say, we're sorry. I think we are owed an apology along with an explanation. A lot of people who are fascinated with this subject will, will say, look, the public is ready to know. We need to know. This is a part of every mankind's future. Every person on this planet needs to know what's going on. We're ready for the reality. But the reality is, this is a subject that will affect billions of people. Half of this planet still, you know, professes their 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 love and their prayer to a religious deity. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I would consider myself in that category, just to clarify. There are a number of people out there who believe it's going to affect the economy. It's going to affect everything, uh, you know, because if we find out that any government in this world has been hiding free energy or anything of the sorts, that's going to open up an entire Pandora's box. The finances I'm very curious about. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who are so fearful of this that it could cause them to do some things that normal people or in a normal time would not do. Do you see the the this as a concern for the debate over any type of disclosure? Absolutely. Um, I feel like toilet pa toilet paper is an excellent indicator of how people are going to respond to stress. Like 
I don't know how it was in your neck of the woods, same way, but same way, like ridiculous. Um, knee jerk reaction after knee jerk reaction. Um, and I, th- I think that that is why the effort. Everyone keeps repeating the mantra: disclosure isn't disclosure is a process. It's not a single shot to for disclosure. It's got to be something that's rolled out slowly to try to be absorbed in small pieces. My personal speculation on this is that just like what you said earlier about, hey, they're not talking about Russia and China anymore, is that we're currently going through a process of elimination by the government. And they're going to start to pull things off the table one at a time, one at a time until we're left with, all right, guys, we've told you what it's not. We're going to take that next step and tell you what's left. There's only one thing that's left, and it's an, an, an intelligence that's engaging with us that's not human. It's a non-human intelligence that is here and engaging with us. That's what I think is happening right now. They're just pulling one piece away from us at, the, at, at, at a time. In your mind, what is disclosure? Um. Disclosure can be multiple things. Um, It could be an experience. I consider an an experience a form of disclosure. Official disclosure, officialdom, is going to be coming from the President of the United States of America stating that we have a non-human intelligence interacting with us. That's what the, the, the golden prize is, is getting the President to speak at the White House about it. That's disclosure. Uh, we're a long way from that is the impression that I'm under. I don't know how long it's going to take, uh, but if I couldn't have guessed four years ago when the New York Times article came out that so much would have happened. It, do, it did not seem like there was this much that could have even occurred. It's The runaway disclosure is what Richard Dolan has described in the past, where after, after you go so far you reach the tipping point to where it's going to accelerate and it's going to come out quickly and fast so for it to be as slow and and methodical as it's been has blown my mind because i thought it would have followed the pattern that richard dolan described and just after a certain point it would have rushed into the public knowledge and we would have demanded more Uh, i have yet to see any of the major mainstream media outlets cover the comments that the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson made just last week. Like no one's covering that. And that's to me is a big freaking deal. Uh. You know, you know what the UFO world needs is when someone like Bill Nelson calls and says what he is saying, or Elizondo says something or somebody else of any type of position comes out talking about this. I am really surprised, and I've talked to them about this, that MUFON is not responding and that, more importantly, the SCU is not responding with any sort of media or response with a press release or anything along those lines. I mean, these are the people who we're supposed to be counting on to be on our side, to be our leaders, to be that those focal groups of, of leaders, scientists, and everybody in between we're supposed to have our best interests at heart as the public regarding this phenomena, yet everyone's silent, especially around trying to figure out the whole disclosure process. For me, disclosure is more about everything on the table. Anything that's held out, whether it's bodies at Roswell, whether it's crash retrievals, whether it's Shag Harbor, whether it's Uh, private messages coming from space saying, hey, we can see you from 35 million miles away. I want to know. I want to know. There are people out there who are having some very heinous things happen to them uh, at the hands of what they call aliens, and they need to know what's going on with them. Imagine if it came out, Dan, that the government had a list of people who were being taken. And you have to wonder if the MK Ultra or the MyLab projects are real, which many believe that they are. That's to me what disclosure is, is opening up the books. 
of course it's going to open up Pandora's box of everything. And with America's love of, of litigation, there's going to be a lot of people suing the government over this. If and, it comes and think, out. think about what David Politis is working against right now right. with his missing 411. That could, there could be some crossover between the, the UFO topic and his coverage of missing people that, that could open up a whole box of huge. things. Think about huge, you know, and, and this is the problem is what is disclosure? Because your disclosure is different than mine, which is different from Bob McGuire's, which is different from Danny Silva's, which is different from UFO Jesus, which is different from Mick West. And it goes on and on and on. But that to me shows that if, 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 if not everything is on the table, Dan, there's a narrative to cover things up. And that's my big concern. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel like what you're describing is damage control. Like the government could come out and tell us truth, finally tell us the truth. But then they're going to, of course, try to keep their dirty laundry in their laundry room. They're going to try to do some damage control and prevent like what you're describing from occurring at a uh, tremendous clip, they're going to want to prevent those cases from popping up. And Lou Elizondo, in my opinion, made a poor choice to, to refer to a uh, aerospace contractors being giving, being given certain technology from a recovered craft and not to the other one. Well, I don't care about, Boeing and Lockheed Martin's profit margins. Like that's not what's important to humanity. Humanity is what's important to humanity. That's what I'm more concerned about. I don't care if a, if a company's getting shortchanged. I care about if my fellow human being is being negatively Im- impacted. And that's a good point. Cause in the end, right now with the current narrative, even if it does come out that there are UFOs and they're from space or wherever we all lose. We're all losing. We may call it a win, but how how strong is that win? See where I'm going with that? I don't know if I'm picking up what you're laying down. Well, just in regards to the whole narrative and the cover-ups of these things, if, the, if you're not going to open Pandora's box of ufology, we're not going to get the true story. And the public deserves, like you said, the true story. Yeah, there's a good chance they're going to not provide... The enti- they're not going to show their entire hand. I wouldn't expect them to, not at first. But I do feel like the more information they release, I think that's what most people are saying as well, is if we give you an answer, all it's going to do is create more questions and it's going to want you, make you dig further. So that could be what happens is it opens that door, we put our foot in it, and then the rest of the angry mob with pitchforks comes into the, the Capitol. Dan, we got under two minutes to go with you. Flew on by, my friend. It, it did. It really did fl- fly on by. And I want to say a big thank you. And you can hear that. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Fire halls. No, but I can see you. I can see you looking at something. The, the fire halls. It was a bird. No, the fire halls being called. We got this. These big air sirens. The fire halls about five hundred fifty yard par five that way. So, you know, I mean, I think you can probably maybe 500 yards yeah you could probably lay up in two on the green go for an eagle but uh, they, or 17 like i would be able yeah. to yeah but they got this giant like air air raid siren to call them because before the pa- the days of the pager and everything they had to put an air raid siren to call the local volunteer fire department out who lived in the area so that's why we have a siren we got one minute left and I would love for you to tell everybody where they could find your information. So most people are on Twitter. Not everybody's on TikTok. But if you go f- look me up on Twitter at Hey Look Over There, uh, L U K. I ran out of characters when I was writing that name. Click on my profile. I have a link to my TikTok account there as well. So you can just click on it. It'll take you over there. You can see the four hundred plus videos that I've put up there. And what I would encourage you to do is go back and watch the uh, John Ratcliffe interview with Maria Bartiromo video and then go forward from there. And you're going to be up to date on all the craziness that has ensued since I think that was back in April. It's just been 
balls to the walls since then. So it's been a wild ride and you can catch up if you haven't been riding it. So look me up. Appreciate you guys uh, listening to me and I, I hope to talk to you guys again. Oh, you definitely will, Dan. Definitely will. One of the most level-headed guys looking into this subject. Dan Warren is our guest. And don't forget, you can follow him on TikTok. Fifth pillar of emphasis. You want that. Coming up next on Spaced Out Radio, the fedora-wearing John Hudson brings in his UAP report. We got Shirky Poo's news, as well as we have the thought of the day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. All right, we're clear. Good job, Danny. Thank you, thank you. We'll give you a few claps. So I, I got to tell you this. I never thought that you would have me on as a guest because John Hudson is so good at what he does with updating everybody on current UFO news. He, You are the man, John. You are on oh, it. No. Like- oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But you rocked it tonight, man. You did a great job. I, I was I was glued to it. I missed like the last half an hour because I had to see my, well, I didn't have to, but I enjoyed seeing my daughter. But no, it was a great show. I really loved it. Appreciate it, man. I, I I have tried to I try to keep up with it on a day to day basis. And when I listen to the show, you have things on your plate that I'm like, I didn't know that. I gotta look up that. I didn't know that. I gotta look up that. Oh so, well, thank you, man. I appreciate you're on hearing it, man. that. No, I appreciate it. No, no, no. And actually, I want, I want to talk to you sometime later about TikTok, about TikTok and so forth because I've been thinking about getting into it, but I want to be really careful not to step on your toes and everything because I love what you're doing. You're doing a killer job. So we should talk so, later about stuff and we can start collaborating a little more. Yeah. So, so in my opinion, when, when you get on TikTok, it's trying to, people are going to be attracted to your personality. Like, that's what I'm trying to do. Like, here's my personality. This is me covering it. You're going to cover it a different way. It's not, I, I try to put a little bit of humor and comedy and some of my wit into my stuff, but I think that's what people are attracted to is just be the authentic you and, and the, crowd will find the audience will find you and they'll want to hear it from you just like they want to hear people talking to dave dave interviewing yeah. people that's what they're here for they're not here that's, for, that's what's so amazing about dave is that you know he he comes off so original but he's so fake it's it's, it's, it's an amazing <laughs> acting job you picked up on that too <laughs> totally, totally, totally true <laughs> no but great totally job tonight, man you, you you killed it it was a great show and we really appreciate having you on buddy thanks guys yeah, yeah, all man. right i'm gonna go fill up my cup and drink until my throat feels a little bit yeah, there you not go. so dry. You did wonderful, buddy. You take care, okay? Yeah, good All job. All right, thanks, Dave. We'll talk soon, Dan. See you guys. Good night. Take it easy. Dan Warren, everybody. Man, that was a good interview. Yeah, that, that was good, a lot no, of fun. Good, good, good guy. Good guy. I like him a lot. want to say a big thank you to Obi Flett, to G West, Rex, Andrew, Nicole, Patrick, Cable Guy, Matt, Todd Purden, and Cat Chaser for the amazing Super Chats. Thank you so much for your love and support of what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Really do appreciate the love, man. Really appreciate the love. That was frigging great. <coughs> yeah, that was fantastic. That was fun. That was That was totally fun. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, we're definitely going to be moving to Tic Tac. By the way, John, uh, before we start, we should uh, make the official announcement on the show here before you uh, start the news or the UAP oh, report. Oh, right, right. Because we got some kind of important news that we're going to share. We'll wait until we uh, get back on air. Yep, yep, yep. I saw humor, John, in what you said. That would m- mean that I know what fun is. But what I said when? When you said that uh, I'm fake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, the, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that you know there there are a lot of people out there that are are are, are faking it to a degree, and it's not because they're dishonest; it's because they're not comfortable in their own skin. You know, and, and what people don't realize is it's not their acting that people get turned off of. It's it's the sense you get that they're not comfortable in their own skin, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 
By the way, yeah, that was you, super if, interesting. Learned a lot. If you are on TikTok, I I have started a channel, Spaced Out Radio. I don't even know how to get a picture on the profile. You know what's weird is I can't figure out. I got it on my computer. I can't figure out how to get that same account on my phone. Can't figure it out. Interesting. Well, well, here, here's the. Uh, finally, last night. I I um I I I dug up an old um an old iPhone six that I that I, I just used for VR stuff. Yeah. And I locked it down. Um, you know, stripped all my information out of it and so forth. And so I'm I I've, I've made it basically safe, in my opinion, for me to install TikTok on it. So I installed TikTok last night. I haven't set it up yet, but I'll 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 get to know the software and, and you know, I I I'll be able to pick it up pretty quick and then I'll I'll, just, I'll show you how it works, so don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah, between you and Dan, I, I got a meeting with Dan about this too, regarding Good. regarding uh, TikTok. I just don't know what the hell we're gonna put on there because my ugly mug is not made for TikTok. That's for sure. Yeah, well, I, I think I think a, I think um, you know I, I think a good start. Um, it, well, the problem is is that there's 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 so many different ways we can go about it. You know, um, and if you do a, we could do some original stuff, but then you know it it you know possibly adds a lot of uh, you know effort to the whole to the whole thing and and you know if we want to take what we're already doing and you know you know take portions of it and put it up there then we need to actually set up for that so that you know we have markers and everything so it's not yeah. an anger to edit and all that mm-hmm. got to figure it out but the I... nice thing is the tiktok's really it's really it's really designed and and please dave please don't take this as an insult it's really designed for people like you right it's it's not designed for technical people it's designed for normal folk and uh, and so the, the fact that you figured out all the stuff oh, that you shoot, do for the shoot. show means you'll get it. And welcome back to Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears as we rounded third and we're heading for home tonight. Yep. Want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio and on Instagram, spaced out radio show. It's time once again where we get into the UFO report. Here's the fedora wearing John Hudson. Yeah, John's coming on in to give us the latest and greatest news when it comes to everything UAP. And before we get started tonight, we actually have a very, very important announcement to make. Earlier today, I made an announcement on our social media that we are going to be moving Lynn Wallington's Saturday and Sunday shows back a couple of hours, and we are going to follow it up with an after-hours show on YouTube and Twitch, and eventually we'll get to the podcast format for another show. So realistically, what's going to happen is the fedora-wearing John Hudson, along with Big Willie Townsend, and Gemma Jade are going to come together to bring an audience show together for you, the listener, and... It's going to be fantastic. They're going to be bringing in all the hot topics of the week. Every now and again, they'll bring in someone to join their panel to talk about those hot topics of the week. And it's an exciting move for us. Uh, It's uh, going to bring Lynn in a few hours earlier. And Lynn is going to continue to do some fantastic work that she does with her interview skills on the weekend. And then something different where everybody gets a chance to participate in the After Hours show on our YouTube channel and Twitch. So I'm very much looking forward to this, John. And congratulations to you and to Willie and to Gemma for joining the team and uh, being a part of the weekend broadcast. 
It's going to be epic. I'm really looking forward to working with both of them. They've both done some really interesting stuff lately, and I think we're going to make a good combination where you know, uh, you know, you know, you're all going to have someone to you know kind of connect with and relate to a little bit, and uh, we're going to have some very different points of view, and uh, and so hopefully it's it's going to make for a really good show for you guys. And and if it doesn't, it's kind of your guys' fault because it's all going to be based on your content. So there you go. Yeah, well, it's literally going to be my fault because I'm the one. Who- <laughs> <laughs> literally going to be my fault. Well said, sir. But uh, well but, said. but you know what? On 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 the Saturday night show, eventually there may be some Chad Smith sightings, and mm-hmm. uh, and other people. And Sunday there's going to be a plethora of hot topics as well. So I'm very much excited. That show will be starting the second weekend of December, and that's and that a- means if you want, you get five hours of Space Out Radio on Saturday and Sunday mm-hmm. if you're if you're up for it. I totally agree. And I'm very excited to have all of you guys uh, coming in. And, uh, you know, it, it's very easy to see the professionalism in you, John, in Willie, and in Gemma, and the, the amount of knowledge that the three of you have. I'm very excited about it. Very excited about it. And, you know, I we, we got to get everything sorted out. We got a number of weeks here to get everything sorted out. That's gonna, And those weeks are going to go fast, trust me. And, but I'm telling you, I think this is the, the real cool thing to do for our audience and expanding it. Lynn does such a professional job on Saturdays and Sundays. She is our rock on the weekends and then adding you guys to take the audience into the after hours and the late nights, especially on the East Coast and in the central time zone mm-hmm. and, and over in Europe that people are listening. I think it's it's going to be amazing, amazing programming that keeps the hot button topics that we love around here alive for a little bit longer on the weekends. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're we're all going to have a really good time. We're going to get a lot of different topics going on, and and uh, it should be a blast. I'm really looking forward to it. And and you know, thanks, Dave, for the opportunity you're giving all of us. And and uh, thank you for the listeners for all your support. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you, my friend. I really do appreciate you. And uh, you know, let's let's see where it goes. All right, let's get to the unbiased UFO report here because I believe we are starting off with NASA once again. Or no, that's last night's. That's last no. night's. I'm way, way, yes. way behind. We, we, we're starting with, with Tucker. Yes, Tucker Carlson joined by Tom Rogan to discuss the yes. Robert Salas event. Yes, yes. So this this was a this was a fun one to 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 pick up on because first off you got you got Tucker stepping up to the plate once again and you know uh, I know everyone has opinions about him I do too right I have my own challenges with with, with Tucker um, but you know we really appreciate his effort for for this movement and and he's not just focusing on Elizondo he's he's moved on to other important topics like Robert Salas's um, uh, event that he did uh, in Washington about uh, nukes and, and UFOs and uh, and he didn't just bring on you know Nick Pope or, or something like that he actually brought on Tom Rogan and they had a good conversation. They showed um, some uh, testimony of of, uh, of some of the people. Uh, Tucker car- covered it in a very serious way. He tried very hard to bring attention to the seriousness of it and and his frustration that it hasn't been widely covered. And it was a it was a good it was a good it was a good you know short segment on the topic that. I mean, let's face it. I don't know if he still is, but for a while, Tucker was the number one news show in the country. So a lot of lot of eyes saw that episode. So it's good stuff for all of us. So for people who aren't familiar with Robert Salas and his event, what happened there? Yeah. So basically, this was um uh, this was kind of a, a of an active uh, a, a live action rerun. Um, in that essentially this is a was a repeat with um with some new with some new folks, some new very important folks, where essentially a sort of mock um you know kind of a mock sort of congressional event is set up where where you know you would have testimony and stuff um you know as you would in a normal session, and but it's set up with um essentially a you know several very credible. Uh, very heroic um, uh, former service members who were were all in a position during their time in the service to see a uh, an unidentified object interfere with the launch systems of our ICBMs, and um, this is this is about as serious as you get. And um, this is the one place, in my opinion, in this whole scenario that really can be considered a threat. And um, and the the new addition um, this time is, is the gentleman that um, whose uh, name I can't remember now, unfortunately, but who talks about the uh, UFO he filmed 
where he saw a UFO fly around the missile and actually shoot laser beams or, or light beams at the missile and actually interfere with its launch. And, um, and so that's testimony we did not hear before. And so this, all this testimony was done um, up in Washington or over in Washington, I should say. And uh, it was all streamed online and, and it's still on YouTube and you can go watch it. And I highly recommend everyone does. This is a story that's almost 50 years old. That continued after the last time he did this. It wasn't like it all was over at that point. It continued to happen after that. This is an ongoing issue. I understand that. Is it still happening today? I don't know of the last known case where it's happened. And there's been some speculation that um, whoever has been interested in those uh, delivery systems have have now adjusted their interest to energy production systems. And that that's why many of the of our of, of our nuclear fleet has been has been um, engaged with. Um, and so, you know, as far as actually when the last incident was, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that data with me. The last one I heard of, I believe, was a while ago. But the problem is, is that there's a huge lag on when these get reported because you can't report them within any with any reasonable time around when they happened because of, of the NDAs and the security oaths these gentlemen take. So it, it, there's always going to be a huge delay of, of probably at least a decade or more between when an event happened and when we get to hear about it. All right, let's move on here. Back to NASA, Bill Nelson coming out saying that he believes well, we're not alone. And, and, and what's awesome, we talked about this a couple of days ago, but the reason why I wanted to bring it up again is I cannot believe the attention this is getting. And to me, it's been very, very interesting because, you know, if you've been paying attention to the periodicals of the United States for a while, you, you can see that there, there are tiers of, 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 of media groups, right? Where, you know, this group will become aware of it. And then this group will become aware of it. And this group will become aware of it. And you can kind of see it filter through. And, um, I could not believe, and I basically did a, a little image that you, you guys will be able to, to, to look at the notes that, I mean, you're talking about not only, so first off, uh, unidentified, unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAP 1949 on Twitter, he put out one of the first messages showing the clip of Bill Nelson's statements his that single tweet alone right now or as of my my note taking earlier today has 565,000 views now um you know i've i've gotten i think one of my twitter messages get over 100k um barely and it was like one and and that's in like nine years five this is this is an insane reaction to one message on twitter so that alone shows the interest but then you go on and you're talking about the hill you're talking about um, life science. You're talking about, um, I mean, a quartz. You're talking about, um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Like, I mean, so many, it, it actually it got to a point where I, I have this one news reader that I use and I have a UFO subject button. And when I clicked on it, like the first, like eight articles that came up, like, like seven of them were all about his speech. Like th this is having a huge impact on people. And to me, it's it's one, it's really interesting because it shows to me that NASA still has the floor and they they will be the ones, I think, that are probably in the best, best position to be making announcements, which I'm very surprised by, to be very honest. And um, and, it, and it shows that, that you know, independent of what else is going on and where, where you know, someone like Elizondo might be trying to, you know, slow things down a little bit as far as the information getting out, you know, this happens and boom, the reaction to it is tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Well, if anybody should know, it's NASA. And you and I debated this in the After hour show just a, a couple of nights ago. And, I, and like I said with Dan Warren, I'm still very upset about this. Yes. Very yes. upset. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, I, I and I wish more people would be upset over this, that NASA is playing dumb on this subject that they're just getting into this when we know for years they have had interactions with ufos and their own astronauts have come back and stated that they have had interactions with ufos during launches and well into space 
And yep, yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And um, and and the thing is, is and I'm sorry, my my earpiece died. So give me a sec here, so I can swap into the other one. Um, but yeah, no. But the thing is, I think Bill Nelson is essentially in the same position that you are. In that, you know, I mean, he just came into this, you know, he's only been the administrator for a short period of time. And, um, and, you know, and, and he only has access to a certain amount of information, you know, and, and other administrators also only had certain, and or certain groups only have access to certain information. I mean, a lot of people don't know how many divisions there are in NASA, right? The NASA near me, they have a huge supercomputing division, right? Those guys are, are so head down into what they do. They're completely unaware of what everyone else does. So my guess is, is that he's in a very similar situation that you are and that he's hearing about all these other things and going, what do you mean you guys are telling me you guys aren't working on this? You, someone's got to be working. I mean, I guarantee you that he's going through some of the same frustration you are. Well, I hope so. I would like to hear him say that, though. <laughs> and I realize in his position it's tough. But if you're, you know, enough about this cover-up. Who's for the people on this subject? That's what irks me. Who is for the people? And with NASA now getting into the game of UFOs, I mean, SETI has sat there for 35-plus years and got nothing except one strange radio hit. And and you you didn't believe how many people retire from NASA and go work at SETI. Exactly. It's, it's, an, it's an astounding number of people. No, but uh, I don't... I'm gonna... I know, Dave. I know. I know. But, but the one thing you have to remember is, is that NASA serves at the honor and discretion of the president of the United States, right? Just like everyone else does. And so it wasn't like, you know, NASA was deciding on their own, you know, we need to look. I'm not saying that maybe in the beginning there wasn't one project manager that said, oh, man, you know, we can't tell anyone about this, but we need to get someone involved. You know, I, I have no idea. I'm sure there were people that took actions that they probably weren't supposed to, but ultimately... Um, the classification of this stuff is not under the jurisdiction of NASA. NASA does not have control over what's classified and what is not. That's decided by someone else for them. Right. I know, and I understand that. And I just don't understand why now they're all of a sudden getting into the UFO game. I have so many questions over this. So many questions. Well, I, I, I agree. I agree with what Dan said before, and it was something as similar I said to you uh, the other day, and that is that I firmly believe that if if Bill Nelson had not been the one appointed, that there's a very good chance that NASA would be doing what the Air Force has been doing up till now, and just whistling Dixie. It's really unbelievable, really unbelievable. John, thank you for another incredible UAP report. You're the best out there, buddy, and congratulations you, on. Uh, on the After Hours show that will be Looking starting the second it. weekend of December. Thank you so much, and uh, you're a great influence and, and partner on this team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Much appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. Appreciate it. Have a good evening. Let's get to the news, shall we? Let's get right to Shirky Boo's news. A utility worker doing maintenance on a faulty water well in Iowa raised a pipe from the well and discovered it was covered in more than half a dozen snakes. Latimer-based Mort's Water Company said the worker pulled the pipe up from the malfunctioning well earlier this month and was greeted by eight or nine bull snakes slithering on the structure. The company said that the snakes had apparently slithered into the well through the top of a poorly sealed well casing. Mort's Water Company said the snakes were a surprising sight, but they were not the cause of the well's issue. The problem turned out to be a pump and motor in need of repair. Bull snakes can grow up to six feet long, but they are non-venomous and not considered to be a threat to humans. Yeah, right, until they wrap around your neck. All right, moving on. Traffic on a stretch of the California highway was slowed down, not by traffic, by due to an unusual hazard. Hundreds of rolls of toilet paper. Yes, yeah, somebody preparing for COVID-3036 way, way early, 
Aerial video from the scene shows the rolls of toilet paper were spread across about 100 yards of Interstate 880 in San Leandro, south of Marina Boulevard. Transportation authorities said the unusual traffic hazard caused traffic to slow, but no major backups occurred. The origins of the toilet paper rolls and how they came to be on the roadway were unclear. Witnesses took to social media to question where the toilet paper came from. You know what it is? Someone hoarding due to COVID. Has to be. It's the only answer. It lived rent-free in her head for 20 years. A Georgia woman was shocked that a huge booger in her nose was actually a bead that had been lodged in there for two decades. Yes, a TikTok video documenting the disgusting discovery has racked up over 7.5 million views. I stared at it in amazement. It was huge. It was inside me for 20 years, 23-year-old Hannah Hamilton stated. The revolving and the revolting phenomena first came to light after the Smyrna resident suffered a sinus infection earlier this year that left her nose completely congested. Hoping to get the root to the root of the problem, she examined her nostrils with an earwax camera and discovered a blue object lodged inside her nasal passage. Fortunately, Hamilton managed to extract the sapphire sinus squatter and examining the object, the memory of a bead flooded back to her. I don't remember much about that time, but my mom was very into arts and crafts, so we always had beads, glitter, etc. around the house. The lady recalled of the incident, which occurred when she was only three years old. The memory I had is of me standing in front of the linen closet in the kids' bathroom and pulling the bead out of a basket in the closet. She then popped the bobble into her nose to see if it would fit, because that's what kids do. What can fit in my nose today? But... She couldn't get it back out. Hamilton reportedly didn't even think to tell her mother, who was a nurse for 10 years. As the years went on, the blocked-up woman gradually forgot about the incident until a year ago when Hamilton recounted the childhood story to her fiancé. I was telling my fiancé that I remembered sticking the bead in my nose as a little kid, but don't remember it coming out. However, at the time, she assumed... It's not a real memory, maybe something I had seen or heard on a show or a book. It was only when Hamilton finally picked that booger out that she realized that it just wasn't in her head, so to speak. Thankfully, removing the inadvertent heirloom went off without a hitch. I bet you she could sell that and make money off that on eBay. I really, really do. It's gross. Thought of the day of today, what impact does hashtag UFO Twitter have on the UAP world and news of the day? Uncle Dale says, I don't twit. Ted, it doesn't seem to amount to much. James, zero. Joe, Joe don't tweet. Lee believes it's zero, same as John Cardi. Chris, oh, I forgot that's a thing. Lori, didn't know it was a thing until a short time ago and soon realized it's not really a thing. Kevin, the men and women who make up the core of UFO Twitter have defined the modern zeitgeist of the UAP culture. Bob, nothing except noise, Sturm und Drang. Thank you, Science Bob. Appreciate all the comments on the thought of the day. Thank you to Shirky Poo for the news, John Hudson for the UFO report, and Dan Warren as our guest tonight. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAP, Spreaker, Revolution Radio, Facebook, The Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. Yes, the 
blue train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night.